Yeah, that's you move that. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Is, there, is anybody awake, or did they have too much wine last night? <laughs> I want to make sure they write really good sell side notes. <laughs> Um, good morning, everybody. I think I said hello to most of you yesterday, but for those people who I didn't have an opportunity to see, I'm Patty on Erlob. I'm from Investor Relations at Constellation. Welcome uh, to beautiful, sunny California. Um, we're going to spend the next few hours this morning um, talking about the wine and spirits business. So um, I'm going to bring up Robert in just a second, but with me today from Constellation is uh, Robert Hansen, who's president of Wine and Spirits, um, Jim Sabia, who's the chief marketing officer for Constellation, Sam Glazer, who heads up operations um, for Constellation for the wine and spirits business, and Lisa Schnorr, who's the CFO for uh, the wine and spirits business. I also have with us um, Sandy Dominic and Mike Reitz from our treasury team, and uh, Laura, Adam, and Tom from the IR team. And I get the uh, pleasure of making sure that you all um, forward your attention to the forward-looking statements here so that um, our lawyers who are watching know that we did this. And uh, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to, uh, to, to Robert now. Here you go. I thought you were going to read the whole thing, Patty. Oh, Come on. No. Good <laughs> morning, everybody. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for being with us. I know it's been some time since the Wine and Spirits Division has uh, held an uh, investor day. And we're really happy to be here with you. Uh, for those of you who are able to join us in, uh, in Utah at High West, um, obviously you get a second round of an incredible place to work. I saw the operations scene this morning and I'm like, you get to wake up to this every single day, do you? Um, so uh, we're ha thrilled to have you in, in Napa. Uh, and I will tell you, those of you who I told last night that I would be doing this since we drank whiskey at lunch on a Monday, I had whiskey again last night and some red wine from Mount Veter. I did take my apple cider vinegar tablets and I had a little golden milk this morning. So it's my way of prepping for you. And I saw a few of you in the gym this morning, so hopefully we'll be okay. Um, just a bit of a reminder that I, um, and I'm really sincere when I say this, I tend to be one who doesn't like to get out ahead of a, you know, my ski tips and usually want to only be in front of uh, shareholders and investors when there's a proof of concept. But it's been a long time since Wine and Spirits has talked to, uh, you know, our um, uh, buy and sell side uh, uh, partners as well as our, our uh, banks and investors uh, about our go forward strategy. We understand that, um, you know, you view this business to a certain degree as not having been investment grade for the past several years. Um, and hopefully, as we you know, present the strategy to you, because it's going to be me, Sam, uh, Lisa, and Jim talking through what we're planning to do strategically, but also across operations finance, and then what we're doing with our brands to deliver against the strategy that I walk you through, that you'll have a sense of where we're taking this business, which is very different from where uh, it has been in the past. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get a sense of me and us. I think we are quite transparent. We're a public company. So as Patty said, we can only talk about certain things. Uh, but for as, as much as we can be super transparent in answering your, your questions about our strategy, uh, we certainly will be. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I was on the board for six years. I could not be more uh, enthusiastic about being in an operating role in the wine and spirits business. Many of you asked me last evening, um, sort of in a blunt way, why I took the job. There's a number of reasons for that, but I will tell you, uh, I think this is an incredible company uh, that has a really interesting total corporate strategy across um, beer and cannabis. Uh, I'm on the board of CGC as well. Uh, and now, uh, I think in the way that we're looking at the wine and spirits business, uh, we believe, uh, combined with our peer divisions, that we have an opportunity to add uh, uh, tremendous value to the company over time uh, as we execute this strategy. So sort of getting into it, I just wanted to give you a quick summary of the way that we're looking at the business. And then we're gonna dig into details. I'm gonna do a bit of it, but Sam and Lisa and Jim are gonna do the majority of the heavy lifting this morning. Uh, but it all starts with just aligning around uh, where we wanna take the business. Um, and you know, to get one of the comments and questions that I heard from all of you yesterday and a few of you last night out of the way, Obviously, the divestiture to Gallo has been, uh, you know, a, tra uh, a, a, a lingering issue throughout this year. Many of you have asked about it. Obviously, um, it has been an unexpected, uh, lengthy uh, divestiture that has required management attention, but it has not taken any of our focus off of what we believe uh, is possible with the remaining 
brands in our portfolio over time. And, and this really is the summary of that. Uh, if, if you think about how the brand, uh, the division was positioned in the past, it was a very broad portfolio of both wine and spirits brands that competed across a, a, a tremendously broad uh, price tier, price segmentation across a tremendously broad set of consumer segments, and frankly, a tremendously broad set of brands that didn't have a, a connective tissue uh, to the extent that we think the new portfolio uh, as we take the company forward will. Um, we really are focused on this vision of creating a bold and innovative high-end wine and spirits company uh, that is very focused on uh, creating exceptional brands with amazing products that people want to drink uh, and wrapping them in uh, tremendously uh, compelling and highly differentiated consumer experiences. So that is the singular focus of everyone that's working in wine and spirits moving forward. Um, and uh, I'll t we'll talk about how this also applies to some of the more opening price point brands in our portfolio moving forward. Um, we do have an aspiration, and it will take some time to get there because we understand the wine and spirits business has not been growing um, at a consistent or um, investment grade rate for some time. But we believe uh, in the end that as we fully execute and get into a rhythm on this strategy, uh, we feel that we'll be in the position to outpace the high end, which we would define as above $11 wine and above $15 spirits, uh, outgrow the market. Our intent is to grow a point or two above the direct weighted average competitive set uh, of the brands that remain in the company and those that, that will be added to our portfolio over time. And especially to do so in a highly profitable way. Um, there's one thing about growing your share and another thing about growing your revenue, but if you're doing it in a low quality manner, meaning just simply leveraging price uh, to get to those outcomes, it doesn't deliver sustainable returns because it's not profitable. So we wanna be in the position to out-execute our competitors and are very much focused on uh, growing our uh, operating margin uh, to around that 30% benchmark. That's, uh, you know, that's a, a, a significant lift. It'll be a mid-single digit lift from where we are today. But on the other hand, I think you'll hear from us uh, that it's not just a goal. We've, we've really started to attack brand by brand what it's gonna take across um, cost of goods sold to hit the gross profit, um, including mix and pricing in that, and then where there is SG&A leverage across the company to deliver this outcome and feel confident we can get there over time. Uh, you know, strategy is important in the sense that the winning companies typically have a clear vision, uh, a rallying cry, which we've just shared with you, and a consistent set of strategic pillars. These are not going to change. Um, we're sharing them with you because they are the pillars that we intend to grow the company with over the next, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we're very much focused on the high end, and again, I'll, we'll, we'll address how that applies to some of the popular price point brands in our portfolio, but high end is our focus, and it's possible even in a popular price point brand to create a high end consumer experience. Incredible quality wine presented in a narrative that uh, really respects the consumer who's buying at that price segment. Uh, power brands. Uh, we have uh, a much more focused portfolio uh, uh, post the divestiture, uh, but even within that portfolio, there are about 10 brands that are gonna matter tremendously to the ability for us to deliver the goals that I've just articulated to you. So we'll be focusing more on those, and Jim will take you through the progress we've made on a number of them already today. Consumer poll. Um, uh, this has been a sales-led push industry that has relied on price as the pro uh, primary growth driver for quite some time. Many of us talked about that last night over drinks. Uh, but the reality is, is consumers are in charge now. Um, they have full control and they're very demanding. And increasingly, they want to put their dollars against brands that match their aspirations and lifestyle. And so we're really focusing on building brands that have that level of distinctive brand narrative and consumer pull. Uh, and then to get to the you know 30% operating margins, we'd be deliver, de delivering uh, industry-leading margins. So we're 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 very much focused there. Um, the thing that did surprise me a bit, honestly, from stepping from the board into the operating company is the work that the executive team uh, in Wine and Spirits and I have to do to put some basic um, uh, processes in place that will enable us to scale this business um, consistently and successfully over time. 
Uh, I was talking to a number of you, I think you, Vivian, uh, about this. It's not the thing that you wanna spend a lot of time on, it's not stuff that you should have to care about, but it is important that you know we are doing all of this work. Uh, because it's one thing to say, this is where we wanna get to. Uh, the question I would ask if I were you is, what are you putting in place that's different and how are you gonna get there in a consistent way to deliver the outcome? Um, and as I uh, worked with the executive team to really listen and learn about what was going on, what was working, what needed to be improved, what became clear to me for a, uh, you know, a, a CPG company of our size and profitability, uh, some very basic things were not in place at the level that they need to be in place for us to scale successfully. Uh, and those are the five things that are listed here. I'm jumping past values for a second, I'll come back to that. Um, but in terms of differentiated capabilities, integrated planning, and when I say integrated planning, it's not just within the company, but all the way through to our distributors, so that we have a bottoms up, top down, agreed plan going into each fiscal year that's aligned with the strategy, and that we have anticipated all of the issues that could in confront the division in advance of it happening and have created contingency plans to ensure that we can deal with those things and execute to our goals. Um, Sam, you'll hear from him in a moment, uh, is uh, driving a pretty significant end-to-end -end supply chain transformation. Many of you know this division. It has been essentially put together through a series of uh, mergers and acquisitions over time. Uh, but what we needed to do is step back and say what kind of supply chain is required moving forward to support the high-end aspiration that we have and the portfolio that we're gonna be carrying forward. Uh, and so there's some exciting transformation uh, 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 goals that Sam and the team are driving and have made tremendous progress on already. Uh, revenue growth management. Uh, a number of you had questions about our depletions performance in the first half of the year. Um, what I will tell you is uh, the depletions performance in the second quarter was driven, as Bill said on the conference call, in large part by our choice not to repeat um, some value-destroying pricing promotional activities that occurred last year. They drove volume, that drove depletions, but ultimately they did not deliver a good economic return. Uh, it doesn't mean that there won't be uh, uh, competitors in the marketplace that will continue to compete on price. Uh, we are thoughtful about this, and it's not a straight line to the outcome that we think we can deliver over time, but it makes no sense for us to continue to be putting in place pricing uh, strategies that are uh, economically dilutive. So we have taken that choice and we're executing a lot of the revenue growth management that uh, our beer division has actually executed quite successfully in that category. Um, Jim is gonna be talking quite a lot about the evidence we have of success with our power brands already. Um, uh, what we wanna move toward though is an integration between Jim's team in marketing, uh, our sales team and our operations team so that we have going into each year a brand plan product portfolio, pricing strategy, distribution strategy, and marketing mix, that will enable us to drive consumer velocity. And we have work to do to get that in place at the level that we believe can be category leading. And then um, importantly, and I'll, I'll just give you one example here uh, that was a, again a surprise to me, but we're getting on top of it quite quickly, is to get a short, medium, and long-term growth pipeline in place where we've identified consumer-driven NPD that is going to be relevant and highly distinctive for the brand. Um, so uh, what, what was interesting for me when I observed what was going on in the division is, you know, there's a natural go-to-market by which most CPG companies take their new products to market. Um, and that's built against the longest lead time customer who's buying, and it's typically our large national accounts. We did not have that process in place at a robust level, and so we were chasing into NPD oftentimes off cycle. Uh, and selling it into our customers, not on the cycle of when they make their big buying decisions. So we were always a little bit on our heels. So we've caught up for fiscal 20. We have a lot of exciting NPD coming back out in the back half of this fiscal year. Uh, and we're gonna be developing our fiscal 21 and 22 NPD concurrently against this strategy so that we can be on the buying cycles of our large customers and get the benefit, full benefit, of the um, uh, new product development that uh, we're implementing. Uh, but all of that has to be underpinned by um, a winning culture, uh, a culture that's rooted with employees who have a huge ambition and want to win um, and are working in a highly collaborative manner. Uh, and for those of you who I spoke to yesterday, uh, we've revealed this strategy over the last month. I had a private equity background before I joined the Wine and Spirits Division, and so I gave myself essentially 90 days to get the investment thesis in place. 
Uh, and then we started syndicating it with the division, uh, shared it with the board to get their approval uh, for uh, the plan and the investments we uh, intend to make in the business. Uh, and then we had a very blunt discussion within the division. You know, this is what we're gonna do, and you have a choice. You're either on um, with it, all in, or you're not. Um, there's an A job out there for everybody, no hard feelings, but this is where we're headed, and what you can't do is sit on the sidelines with your arms crossed. And that level of transparency has really energized the employee base and the company to help take uh, this strategy forward and execute, because ultimately, uh, winning execution is what's gonna drive the result that we need to deliver. So on a single page with a lot of words, one of the, my greatest challenges in life will be saying more with fewer words, but I'm gonna give, it, give you, the, you know, all I have this morning to help you understand where we're headed. Uh, this is what we plan to do uh, for the foreseeable future and, and believe in, uh, in our ability to execute this in a way that is gonna drive shareholder return from this division. Um, it does require a bit of a mandate, which is a shift for the organization. Um, and obviously, high growth, high margin opportunities is the underpinning of all of this. Uh, when we've dissected the business, what we've seen, and Jim will probably give you a really interesting example on revenue growth management a bit later, um, you know, there's a level of complexity that we've been driving where people have just been pursuing volume but not um, profitable volume. And so we're really dissecting brand by brand, um, product by product, uh, state by state, distributor by distributor, uh, what we've been doing and what we need to do differently to drive growth but also uh, have a, a, a focus on margin. We have a bias towards two types of growth. We have in these 10 power brands that we'll walk you through uh, what we think are large shouldered brands that can carry more varietals or categories in the case of spirits. And so our bias is to leverage those brands more. It's obviously much easier to get growth out of an existing brand where there is already consumer pull. Um, than it is to introduce something completely new to the world. However, uh, we also do believe there are new to world opportunities. Uh, we have really innovative teams outside of the US and Italy and in um, South Asia and Australia and New Zealand that are driving um, some really interesting market innovation. Uh, and we're using them a bit as a, um, a pilot for some new to world brands that we're gonna bring into the mix as well. And then as you know, we have a great ventures uh, division that's making minority investments in high growth categories of business. If I take just two examples, you know, we made an investment, well, three actually, we made an investment in Nelson's Greenbrier, which we've now brought into the portfolio. Uh, we just recently made an investment in Durham Distillery, uh, which is uh, creating a, a really interesting craft gin portfolio, but also has taken a lead in high-end, ready-to-drink cocktails. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, an investment in something like El Silencio, which is taking a strong position in the Mezcal category. So we believe we can leverage our ventures division at the right time to bring new brands into our portfolio once their scale has been proven. Uh, but the primary focus is on these large shouldered, what we call power brands, and there's 10 of them, and we'll walk through them. Um, we also need to be in the position to rapidly address consumer trends. There are five trends I'll talk you through in a moment that we're paying super close attention to, three of which are an immediate focus for us. Um, and then two are longer term transformations where we need to build some capability. Uh, and then of course, as I mentioned, in, in supply chain transformation and really building our N NPD and innovation flow against the go-to-market. So, you know, revenue growth management, um, net sales value over net sales volume, you'll hear us talk about this more and more. The industry is depletions obsessed um, and we understand that, however, um, the reality is, is when you look at pricing and mix on our higher end brands, the value of the brands is going to probably drive more net sales value growth and uh, then volume growth. And we're gonna have to carefully put together a scorecard to help you explain why we see the strategy working and how it's gonna deliver value over time. Uh, we wanna reduce some complexity that we've had in the business. There's just been um, a lot of complexity that has prevented us from focusing on driving profitable growth. Uh, Sam will talk you through a lot of what we're doing in the supply chain around that. Um, and then the operation, uh, operating efficiencies and some of the, uh, the, the processes that I mentioned earlier will be uh, what, what we think we'll put in place to deliver against it. Um, we actually have evidence that the strategy is already working. Um, I know there, again, from a lot of the writing that you've done, as well as some of the questions that we've gotten, 
over the past couple of days, there's, there, you know, I, I, essentially I think people are looking for a silver bullet, which is the business was here and now you want it to be perfect. Uh, and the reality is that's not how things work. You know, you know, there's never a straight line to the outcome. It's always, you know, a bit of a, uh, yeah, a, a process to get there. Uh, but we believe that we're on track to exceed market growth in our IRI channels with the power brands that we mentioned. I'll give you an example of that in a moment, and Jim will further validate it in his presentation. Um, if you isolate the uh, Remain Co portfolio, we're actually not too far away from our gross profit target um, at the moment with the mix of brands that are uh, going to remain with the company, um, well above the total uh, margin performance of, of, of the existing portfolio, including, of the, uh, including the portfolio of divested brands. Um, EBIT will take some work, but in the end, between what Sh Sam shares with you uh, to, to get our gross margins to the target that we have established, the profit and mix opportunities that we have beyond that, uh, and then the SG&A leverage that Lisa's gonna walk you through, we feel confident that we have a glide path to get to that 30% operating margin. Uh, and we'll continue to be dogmatic to, to achieving it. So this is a long-winded way of saying, uh, I think there's evidence and we're gonna try to provide some uh, examples of that to you uh, throughout the morning and then we'll take your questions about it as we move on. And the first and most important one of which is uh, the IRI uh, performance of not all but uh, a good majority of the power brands in the portfolio um, through the middle of August. So if we look at how in aggregate those brands performed, their, uh, their consumer velocity in IRI channels was up 6%. It varied from you know, a high of up, uh, what, 33% with a high growth brand where we were yesterday, High West. Um, we had uh, about 13% growth in Kim Crawford, 6% uh, in Robert Madavi Private Selection, 11% percent Naomi, 6 percent Svedka, 2 uh, percent in Woodbridge, which is uh, a, a, a really critical brand of ours, very large volume where we're working on improving the margin, but it's out it's outperforming a declining um, a category by about 400 basis points right now. Uh, so we feel confident in that. Um, obviously, our Rafina Prosecco business at 11%, and I mentioned High West at 33. So we're really focusing our efforts and all of our marketing investment behind driving the velocity of these brands and creating consumer pull. Again, most consumer goods categories are about brand, highly distinctive products. We think we make incredible products that are worth reaching for and that people want to drink. Uh, but their awareness levels are generally pretty low. And uh, Jim's gonna share an example, I think, with one of our brands in particular against another competitor that's been around a lot longer and has a higher awareness level, but where our brand actually has a higher net promoter score. And so we believe we just have so much potential as we start to build the velocity behind these brands. Um, so uh, obviously focus around uh, media, but also getting uh, uh, the facings that we deserve given the, the pull on the brands uh, that, our, that our research would show and then having consumer-driven innovation uh, in play. So uh, we plan to accelerate the growth by focusing on 10 power brands, seven of which are in the core of our business and three of which are in our fine and luxury wine portfolio, which we call true estates and vineyards. Um, so the top seven, um, Kim Crawford, Naomi, Woodbridge, Svedka, Vodka, Rufino, Robert Mondavi, Private Selection, and Simi, um, which is the one brand in our portfolio that is dragging a bit because it hasn't been focused on for many years now and needs to be, um, are the core brands that would compete at the premium price point and a bit above that, call it super premium price point. Um, the Prisoner Wine Company, Robert Mondavi Winery, where we'll be a bit later today in High West Whiskey, would be uh, the brands that we're gonna focus on in our luxury and fine portfolio. Uh, who, uh, these are brands that have significant potential. Um, somebody was asking me a question about uh, the Prisoner Wine Company yesterday and saying it's got a large volume already for a wine that sells on average around $45 to $50 net sales price. True. Um, but this is a brand that's been created as a new to world wine brand. It competes uh, in a very different way than a lot of heritage brands. It's got a very unique market position. Um, it's already gotten to a couple hundred thousand cases. We think that that combined with the new brand development we'll do within the uh, prisoner portfolio, 
um, we have the potential to significantly grow the total prisoner wine company family. And that's just but one example. So you'll see that we're very focused on making sure that we're competing by um, tier, uh, but creating high-end, highly distinctive experiences for each one of the brands, regardless of the tier in which they compete. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a, a comment about Woodbridge in a moment um, uh, as an example, a proof point of how disciplined we're being across every aspect of evaluating its performance potential to give you an example of why we believe this will work. Um, the, the other thing that we've done, and again, all, all companies should do this or do do this, uh, but if we believe that we want to compete and win in the high end, we then went and dissected what the growth drivers are in the category in the high end in wine and spirits, and then how much market share do those growth drivers currently represent um, of their price segments. And ultimately what you see is where we plan to play with our broad-shouldered power brands in the wine uh, category, where we're frankly underdeveloped relative to where the category share is and where the growth is coming from. And it's broadly a Chardonnay and Cabernet story. You know, as you know, Chardonnay is making a pretty significant comeback across all price points now. Uh, we have not been focused on that varietal as much as we should be, and we have some brands that can really carry um, some really exciting um, uh, new product introductions as well as to uh, upgrade the taste profile and market position of some of the existing uh, uh, products that we have in the portfolio. So across super premium, ultra premium luxury and super luxury, we're gonna be focusing on Chardonnay and Cabernet. We uh, believe there's a big opportunity, <coughs> excuse me, with our Rufino brand uh, in uh, the uh, luxury Pinot Grigio space. Uh, and then obviously sparkling, particularly uh, brands like Prosecco, and we think California sparkling are big opportunities for us as well um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in the portfolio. So you'll see most of the new product development that we're doing in our core power brands and our, uh, our true estates and vineyards are gonna be focused in these varietals. However, um, and I'm gonna go back to mentioning how we leverage some of our international uh, portfolio, uh, there's been a new brand that we launched in, um, in Australia and New Zealand that was targeted to an underserved consumer segment in the wine business um, that has immediately jumped up to a high level of performance and consumer velocity. Uh, we're bringing that brand into the U.S. Uh, in our, our next fiscal year uh, because we believe so strongly that it's a brand that's being built in a new economy environment targeting an underserved consumer segment um, and has the potential to be added into the portfolio without creating any complexity because we've already proven the concept in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and that would play across these price segments as well as a couple, uh, these uh, varietals and price segments as well as a couple of, of additional varietals. So we'll continue continue to pursue new to world opportunities, but be very careful about proving the concept before we start to scale them. And in spirits, uh, you know, look, the story here is really about vodka, whiskey, and tequila, but, <coughs> excuse me, we're paying very much attention um, to some new categories of business, such as gin, for example. So we've analyzed all of the price segments and opportunities. Obviously, popular vodka is incredibly critical to us because of the Svedka brand, and that's where the brand competes from a price segment. Uh, but looking at premium, super premium, and ultra premium, we think we have incremental opportunities Many of you asked why, how, why do we believe so much in High West and how, why did we build capacity? Why did we put the capital investment in? And I think the numbers here tell the story of the potential for significantly further growth in whiskey, particularly American whiskey, and High West has a very distinctive market position there. Um, so we're really gonna be focusing on tequila and mezcal, vodka across price points, and whiskey, particularly American whiskey, across price points, um, leveraging our broad-shouldered brands, but looking for incremental opportunities to extend the brands we have. Um, so that is uh, essentially the focus that we have against the profit pools in both the wine and spirits businesses in the high end. Um, so as we've summarized them, um, what we have done is, is looked at things we're gonna act immediately against, uh, things that we're gonna explore, and areas we're gonna monitor. Uh, and I'm gonna focus really what's on the, um, the right side of the grid for, for the sake of focus and time this morning. Um, so 
we did the analytics around what's driving growth in the high end uh, in both wine and spirits and made decisions to focus on super and ultra premium uh, Chardonnay and Cabernet, as I mentioned, uh, super and ultra premium California bubbles. Uh, we're focusing on luxury Pinot Grigio from Italy. Uh, and then really looking at our portfolio and how we could leverage our existing portfolio, um, potentially extending some of our existing spirits brands, um, uh, but also looking at some of our ventures plays in premium vodka, tequila, premium plus whiskey, particularly American whiskey. Uh, and I'll talk about ready to drink in a moment, but high quality single serve ready to drink is, is another area that, that, that we wanna focus on in addition to um, uh, cans and Tetra and, and convenience formats and wine. Uh, exploring opportunities already, and these would be for further out, meaning fiscal 22, uh, if not sooner, uh, certainly fiscal 22, and super and luxury Chardonnay, um, uh, super and ultra premium, uh, rosé, we want to look at French rosé as an opportunity to complement our existing portfolio, uh, premium California rosé, uh, we're underdeveloped in that category, and then of course I mentioned gin and mezcal, uh, as well as uh, aperitifs, uh, in the ready to drink category in particular. So that's important, but we have to be able to essentially walk and chew gum at the same time. So that's the core of the innovation strategy with our large shouldered power brands. Um, but we then looked at what are the changes in consumer behavior that are gonna impact the wine and spirits business dramatically. And uh, of course, you, you probably continue to see and hear from others about this and read about it on an ongoing basis. Uh, but we, would, we believe that we have to pay attention to convenience formats, cans, Tetra on the wine side, um, and uh, single serve ready to drink cocktails on the spirit side, and potentially the aperitif side, because we believe these are highly disruptive. As we've looked at the plug and pulls um, with our large customers, and we look at how consumers are choosing to shop from 375s to smaller single serve formats. There is a material shift coming with certain consumer cohorts, um, obviously younger consumers in particular, but not limited to younger consumers uh, who are looking for convenience and ready to drink. And it's being disruptive because it's not about cheap and cheerful product. It's about ready to drink with really high quality liquid. And we think being able to do incredibly high quality, high end brands and spirits in single serve formats is gonna be important to our success moving forward. And that's part of the betterment trend. You know, there are, there are, there's content that's driving the betterment trend that yeah, consumers are focused on. But there's also part of this, which is about consuming a bit less and higher quality products. And so we're putting a focus on that. Longer term, uh, and I'm gonna spend just a moment here because it's important. Um, Longer term, uh, the, the reality is the consumer's in charge, technology has given them all of the power in terms of knowledge. I was surprised coming from an industry where 15% of sales uh, is done through direct to consumer, whether boutiques, e-commerce, e or omni-channel, uh, that uh, in this business it's only about two, 3% right now. Um, and that's split across both direct to consumer and three tier e-commerce. I was also surprised to find, as I've gotten to know, and I have a huge amount of respect for our distributor partners, how they view uh, e-commerce as uh, both an opportunity and frankly a threat to the traditional route to market that has existed. And I've been through this before in a number of different industries, and I'll just tell you, you can only look at it as an opportunity. Because if you look at it as a threat, what you're gonna do is be on your heels when the consumer has made the choice and the category dramatically accelerates. So numbers. Um, Three-tier e-commerce is growing at 40% year over year. Our three-tier e-commerce business is growing at 52% year over year. So we're well outperforming the category growth, albeit off of a very small base. But it shows that the consumer is choosing a different way of buying. Um, we also know that the direct-to-consumer business, which is very small, is growing um, about 15% year over year. We're growing at 16%, so slightly outperforming the category growth. So over time, and we're gonna do a proof of concept with some of our high-end brands, we are going to prove that it's possible to integrate the tasting room experience and uh, a direct-to-consumer e-commerce experience 
create that experience for those of us not fortunate enough to make it to High West Dist Distillery or to the Robert Mondavi Winery and have the tastings you'll have a bit later today and be in the position to grow our power brands uh, in the way that the consumer is choosing to buy. Um, and we're engaging with our distributors because I, I, I don't only use examples from my prior experience, but every time I've confronted a, distri a wholesale distributor that is concerned about a brand engaging a direct-to-consumer, what we've done is a proof of concept. And in one case, you know, it took a really critical trading radius from $8 million to $20 million, and that was within just a few blocks radius of a single store. And when my, one of my uh, former employers opened up a boutique uh, adjacent to one of our core uh, specialty uh, retailers, uh, the trading radius grew to 20 million, of which the wholesaler got 12, so it grew their business by 50%, uh, and my company got the, got the balance. And ultimately, it was the, uh, the tide that rose all boats, uh, and it created a significantly stronger brand position within that marketplace. So our belief system is that this will happen, and we intend to prove it carefully with some of our true estates and vineyards portfolio, and then double down on the balance of the portfolio over time. And then there's no question, you read all about this, that uh, especially younger consumers are going to be more demanding of the companies that they do business with to create sustainability as a core aspect of how they go to market. I think, um, you know, Sam and team, particularly on the operation side, do a lot of great work already um, in sustainability, and we haven't told that story. So we want to do that first, and then we want to really focus on becoming an industry leader in brands uh, that have a sustainability underpinning to how they compete. It matters a lot because the brand narrative is going to matter more and more and more as people are looking for consumer experiences. So that's really where we're gonna be focusing, and this isn't a one-year plan, this is a multi-year effort, um, and we have to have a destination in mind. So this is where we're focusing. I mentioned these five areas, so I'm not going to go into them in detail. Uh, again, I know from having spoken to uh, you know, public uh, analysts, uh, public company analysts uh, throughout my career, um, that, that this stuff can sound like a lot of wah, 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 you know, it's stuff you just need to get in place um, uh, as basic capabilities to run a company. But I would also tell you that it's great to have a strategic vision, but if you don't have the foundation upon which to scale, it's not sustainable. And I think part of what has led to the underperformance of the division is there just hasn't been a robust capability to execute. And I'm really proud of the team because they've embraced these areas and we have made incredible progress in a very short period of time of getting uh, all of this in place. Uh, you know, we're, we're planning in an integrated way. We have syndication sessions with all of our distributors planned in uh, early January. They've started now, but robustly in early January and February before we enter our next fiscal year. Uh, Sam will show the progress we've made on the supply chain. Uh, we've made really strong progress on a number of our critical brands, particularly the popular and premium price point brands on revenue growth management. Jim will share, you, share with you the great progress we've made on brand management. And then importantly, the hardest thing was to get caught up on our innovation pipeline. So we have already completed the NPD for 20 and 21 um, broadly, and we're focused now on 22 as we're executing 21 so we can get caught up to the buying cycles. Uh, some of you have asked, what do we expect in terms of the revenue profile? Um, and we expect essentially about a 75%, 25% split between organic growth and innovation and NPD. Uh, this isn't an absolute number. It won't be exactly applied across every brand in the portfolio the same way. Uh, there could be a higher innovation NPD number in certain brands because of where they are in the state of their development. Uh, but broadly speaking, organic, meaning just naturally organic growth through improving the quality of our products and execution of them combined with um, our revenue growth management efforts, um, and then adding the NPD top spin on top of all of those brands, we think the mix will generally work out this way. And if we look at the revenue growth profile, we're taking a slightly more conservative view of fiscal 21 because we have a lot to get in place uh, and then believe that we can hit a rhythm of being in that uh, sort of mid single digit you know, bracket of, of revenue performance growth uh, for the foreseeable future. So that's how we're seeing our revenue profile. Um, and as I wrap up, I just want to give you two examples, and then I'm going to ask uh, Jim and, uh, when he talks brand and uh, Sam when he talks uh, the supply chain transformation to give you a lot of specifics on this. But look, we get it. You know, Woodbridge, 
private selection and Svedka make up a large amount of our revenue, you know, over 50% of our revenue, under 50% of our value. Um, so we have to win with those brands. We believe it's possible to put out a high-end brand experience, which I think Jim is gonna show you, uh, on brands that compete at prop popular price points. Most American families spend less than $10 a $7.50 to put a bottle of wine on their table. We get that. But it is possible to put excellent product out, um, get some pricing leverage with those brands, and also run them more profitably. So Woodbridge, I'm gonna give you two examples. We introduced spirit barrel aged um, 750s in the Woodbridge brand. Woodbridge is typically a 1.5 liter business. It's the majority of the business. We have not been a competitor in core varietals in 750s. We introduced those spirit barrel aged uh, uh, products and they've quickly become in terms of buy-in about 40% of the total 750 business. Brand new products at a $2 price uh, uh, increase over the core varietals which shows that Woodbridge has leverage when you put really compelling price uh, product innovation in. And importantly, Sam and his team have already laid out a glide path to get about a three to 400 basis point improvement in the core margin uh, on our Wood Woodbridge brand, which has been in decline over the past couple of years. And it's not easy, it's a heavy lift across, you know, improving the quality of, 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 the, of the wines while taking away some of the non-consumer relevant uh, aspects of how we've been running it in the past. Skew rationalization, looking at design to value and dry goods. Uh, we're going brand by brand by brand and looking at those kinds of opportunities. And it is a business that needs to be looked at that way. Um, and then importantly, uh, as Jim will start to, to talk you through, if you take an example of our brands where there is low awareness but high, a high net promoter score versus its direct com competitors, it essentially tells a story where we're not getting the leverage out of the brands that we have in our portfolio that we deserve. And those conversations are therefore easy to have with our distributors and our uh, customers because we can go out and ask for more support and more facings, okay? And we'll get past the uh, momentary distraction of the divestment that's going to happen to, to Gallo uh, and the Heaven Hill transaction. We will obviously, as David and Bill have committed to, hopefully leverage uh, the cash from those transactions to delever the company. Uh, and we'll be in the position to really take this strategy forward. But it's about trading up with powerful brands, having a really strong innovation pipeline, um, and then being in the position to have a steady evolution towards um, towards the high end. I hope to be able to also communicate to you in the next uh, several months um, some uh, investments that we're making, venture-like investments that we're gonna be making to add some brands into the True Estates and Vineyards portfolio over time. That's certainly a continued focus of ours, but more on you know a ventures-like minority investment model uh, until our leverage profile is improved. So to wrap up, I, I know it's a, a lot to take in quickly, but um, this is where we're headed. Um, I have been in the position to have worked on incredibly amazing, authentic brands that had lost their way a little bit and just needed to be built against a robust plan that wasn't just a promise of a better future, but was built around a very robust set of pillars and the hard work that you have to do on the operating model to make sure that it can be done in a scalable way. Uh, and we're excited um, about the potential. Uh, we're excited about the proof points that we have in front of us. We're excited to take what I hear from all of you are extremely tough and very direct questions that are coming our way a little bit later, but that's what this, uh, what, that, that's what this game is about. And with that, I'll say thanks uh, for listening to me for a bit and turn it over to Sam, who's gonna walk you through the supply chain transformation. Good morning, everyone. Um, as we said before, but welcome to Napa. It's home for some of us, and uh, at least we've got windows in this room to be able to see out and uh, somewhat experience what is uh, going to be a fantastic day. Some excitement a bit later on as we uh, venture out into uh, vineyard, winery, land, and see two of our uh, premium houses and what uh, what's exciting time of the year. We're in harvest, and uh, no better time to go and see operations when there's grapes coming in on trucks and. We're taking those grapes and making them into fantastic wines for our consumers as, as we go through. Um, I'd like to uh, just, uh, just uh, welcome a couple of my team that are here. I've got Colin, who uh, runs wine operations for us. I've got uh, Chris, who's sitting over here, is our chief winemaker. You met Brendan yesterday. 
at High West, some of you, who's our fantastic uh, head distiller for our business, and uh, Rachel, who makes sure that everything goes in the right direction, and importantly, too, we have Pepe up here from, uh, from Mexico, to, uh, he's our uh, general manager of Casa Noble, so these guys are going to pull me off the stage when something goes wrong, and uh, I've also got Paddy with the hook if I say something I shouldn't say, so, uh, so with that, three things I want to go through this morning with you. First is what we've done in the last couple of years since we had the opportunity to come together as a relatively new team and uh, they brought me up here from New Zealand, Australia to, uh, to uh, have a look at this fantastic business and the fantastic assets that we had. Secondly is what are we dealing with right at the moment? There's a number of things on our plate, something called a Gallo transaction, something called a consumer that continually tells us they want something different to perhaps what we've got in the tank a couple of years ago. And then lastly, Reasons to believe, if you've heard from Robert, we've got a great vision, a great strategy. We want to make sure that we've got uh, the best financials going around for Wine and Spirits Company. But what, is, what do we do as operations and how, what, are, what are the reasons to believe you, um, us of, well, you of us to make sure we deliver on those uh, aspirations? And I'll give you some examples of where we're headed and, 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 and some work that we're doing in that way. So first and foremost, not only my team are here, they're also here to translate Australian through to English for you guys in the US, so um, hands up when I say something that doesn't sort of resonate and um, they can fill you in quite quickly because they've had a couple of years to do that. So, moving right along. Where have we been? So it's been three years since I arrived and the team's come together as a, as, as, as a group to lead operations through Wine and Spirits. And uh, as Robert mentioned before, we've, we were a business of, great, uh, of buying great things. But we also ran those great things still in the way that they were owned as a separate entity. And it was time to really have a look at those great assets and, and, and what we could do about it. So we were working on what do we want to stand for? Where do we want to be? And what do I, what's the future look like? So we came up with this quality mantra. And for me, a quality mantra really is a core driving principle of where, where I've come from in, in, uh, in my experience and, 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 and my growing up. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be part of a wine family back in Australia. I still am. But uh, that, that gave me a real lesson to whatever we make and whatever we produce we can never compromise on quality at the end of the day. It's got to be best for the price point that we're putting out on the shelf, and the customer's got to choose us over our competitor. And the day that we compromise on quality through anything that we make is the day that we may as well pack our bags and go home. So quality was our mantra, and I'll talk more in a minute around what quality means to us. And then we brought in this concept of highest and best use. We had, as I said before, some magnificent assets but maybe those assets were being used more from a brand lead approach than what does it mean to Constellation. So if I talk about quality in terms of the different aspects that it means to us as a team, first and foremost, we do have the best team in the industry, bar none. We've got the best viticulturists, we've got the best winemaking team, we've got the best operations team, we've got the best finance team, we've got the best HR team, We've got a fantastic team that day in, day out want to make this business better each day. So we can't do anything unless we've got the best team. And they can't do anything unless they see a bright future and some great products, some great brands that they're representing and, and actually seeing them out there being consumed on shelf and, and being pulled off. In the last couple of years, 100 odd medals through not only our, our more uh, um, affordable tiers, but right up to the luxury end. And as you know, they play a, a, a different aspect in, in terms of how we take it to a consumer, in terms of a black box marketing play, in terms of the 50 odd gold medals that we've got on that, right up to a Schrader where we're expecting 100 points day in, day out, and, uh, and from those great wines and, and, and in between. We also have some great results in our spirits portfolio. Casanoble day in, day out is getting great accolades, whether it's through the gatekeepers in, in industry magazines or it's in trade shows, as is High West. Uh, on a continual basis, and you'll start to see Greenbrier get more and more attention from us as we take that into the fold and, 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 and use that. We talk about highest and best use in our vineyards. We have the best vineyard in the world. You will see it this afternoon. It's called Tokelon. There's a lot of industry press around Tokelon. There's a lot of stories around Tokelon. We own 500 acres of Tokelon. There's about another 100-odd that a, a number of other people have. 
There's 500 acres of Tokelon that traditionally has been used for Mondavi. It's been grown from Mondavi. And you know that there's a Mondavi range and it starts at $20 and it goes up to $200, $300. If we grow that vineyard for something like a Schrader or a Tokelon wine company, which is an MPD that uh, one, of, uh, one of the great uh, winemakers of Napa's uh, just released and got 97 points for, and we look at what we're doing with Prisoner in the up spec and the up tiered, you're starting to direct fruit from that fantastic vineyard into those wine programs, you're getting a much better return as a shareholder for Constellation and we're getting a much better asset that we're driving harder. So we talk about four times the gross profit per 9 LE that's now coming off of that vineyard and that fruit sourcing than was three years ago where it was just feeding the, uh, the, Mondavi, uh, the Mondavi range. Now that philosophy just doesn't stop at Toklon. We own something like 10,000 acres here in, uh, in the US when we've got uh, upwards of a, a thousand odd growers and each time we look at a, a block of fruit, we are very clear now on where that block of fruit needs to go in terms of its end wine use. Before it was a bit of a mixed, mixed puzzle and before we make picking decisions and then change the allocation in the winery, which is very confusing for the teams because you want to have an A-class viticulture team who needs to know what they're growing for and the winemaking team need to take that great fruit and make it into the wine that it was destined for. And if we're not converting in that way and measuring that, conver uh, um, that conversion rates, then again, we're paying a lot for fruit. We'll talk about it in a minute, but 50% of our cogs is coming from fruit right through to the finished product and what we see. So there, uh, for us to start lining that up, highest and best use and making sure we make quality decisions right throughout. Had a good chat last night with a group of you around style. We bought Miomi. Has the style of Miomi changed since Constellation owns it? We bought Prisoner. Has the style of Prisoner changed since, we've, since they owned it? In the last couple of years, we've developed our own in-house sensory department. Whilst it's in-house, it's very independent. And I liken it to, say, a food and, uh, food and beverage type where you have a panel that go into a dark room. They don't know what they're tasting. There's dark glasses. They are not winemakers, they are not Constellation employees, they are people off the street that we have trained for three or four months that can replicate sensory and taste uh, nuances or flavours, let's say, in a, in, a, in a wine, in a spirit, in, in food. And their job day in, day out is just to rank the intensity of what they see against those flavours or t um, um, uh, uh, smells. Uh, and from there, we can then do a, like a cluster diagram, Venn diagram, and look at each of the different intensities of those and match that back to the original Miomi we purchased or the original prisoner we purchased. And that allows us to continually make sure that before we package and bottle uh, wine, that, uh, that we are getting exactly into the zone or the cluster that the consumer is buying for Miomi or for prisoner. And we do not allow anything to go to bottling unless it fits into that spectrum of analysis uh, day in, day out. We also do this with MPD uh, in, in terms of what's a new, what's a new product, what's a new flavour, where we want to head, okay, so where does it sit in the intensity curve and then how do we go about it? We'll talk a little bit more about the buttery Chardonnay in Mondavi. It, it's one of those key things. How, what was the intensity of butter that we needed and how can we go about getting it? Highest and best use of capital. It's especially important to us as we start to pivot and look at uh, MPD but having the capabilities to run with MPD or if we want to look at how our vineyards are planted and, and, and we want more fruit. We can't continually spend money on expansion. So the question the team came back with is how hard are we actually using our assets today and if we're using them as a single site point of dis decision making rather than a network of constellation that's, that's where we start to see these efficiencies and these improvements. So three years ago, we were looking at something like $80 million in terms of increased tanks or cooperages, cooperage requirements within our wineries. We put together a network team that looked at each of the different wineries and locations we have, and there's something like 44, and all the tank capacity and the ways we could move wine or fruit around, and suddenly we didn't need cooperage anymore. So we could take that capital from expansion, work our assets harder, and then start to send that back to more important things like a new winery in, uh, in, um, in Italy um, to, to help us with our Prosecco, right, up, uh, up near Venice. Uh, we've been able to do some more vineyard uh, expansion down in New Zealand in Marlborough for Kim Crawford. 
You, some of you would have saw, uh, seen yesterday the new packaging line we have at High West. All these things have, been, have come about from us taking a little bit more time and consideration in terms of highest and best use of capital and making quality decisions around it. And it's not on the slide, but I also say we take a lot of care and a lot of pride in looking after our employees from a safety perspective, and we're always measuring quality in terms of quality checks, consumer complaints, and where that's headed. And we, we, we're working in the right direction, uh, and there's been some great wins and some great improvements over the last couple of years as we made that very much uh, the forefront of what we do day in, day out. The last piece on here is around $20 million. I'll, I'll talk to where we're headed uh, shortly, but what we've done in the last three years, Colin and his team have really driven some product, uh, product, uh, pr productivity initiatives through the wineries. And it's generated over $20 million of savings through our COGS that come through as our standards. So jumping across to our COGS, and I, and I don't want to belabor the point, I think uh, a lot of you in the room already would understand, but uh, wine, wine, wine COGS and spirits COGS are, are different to beer COGS in terms of when we release them and when we sell them. That's when the standards and the margins in the P&L start to flow. So if we go and buy grapes today for Schrader, it's not going to be three years' time until you see that come through in, in, from a P&L perspective. And if we, if we then buy grapes for Kim Crawford, it might be six months to 12, 18 months before you see that. So any savings that we do as a team will take a period of time to materialise themselves through our P&L and the way that they look at. But over the last three years, and we're starting to see it really gain traction now, but we've been uh, beating our, the CPI index by 37%, and we've been 54% lower than a PPI index or basket of goods for a similar competitor size. And that's really giving us great knowledge that these decisions and going after quality and highest and best use is starting to give us the right direction in terms of our standards. And ultimately, our standards are going to help drive those margins that we're all after. So that's where we've been. What do we have to look, look out for and where, where we're heading? The Gallo transaction, as Robert mentioned before, it's taken us a little longer to put this one away. It's still in process, as, as, as all of you know. We've got harvest going on. The team are trying to run wineries that are knowledgeably going to go to Gallo as Gallo assets, so the teams have already got new contracts and things. The fruit's coming in. Everything's going on, but at the same time, the attention to detail at all our sites and, and getting this harvest through has been first, first class. But what I wanted to show you here is, is the extent of the deal. It's, it's the biggest US wine deal in history. Uh, I think the next biggest one was the Treasury Beringer deal or Foster's Beringer deal, about 1.5 billion back then. And then the third one was the Constellation Mondavi, I think, was the third one. So from that perspective, we're dealing with a big beast and we're dealing with a lot of complexity. So what I wanted to show you is where we are today in the blue. Um, so 40 sites, 120 brands, 1,600 employees and ops, making 54 million cases, and we've got nearly got 600,000 tonnes worth of capacity. As context, the industry is about 4 million, uh, 4 million tonnes in, in totality, so we're pushing up around the, uh, the you know, just over the 10%, 10 to 15% in terms of industry, uh, industry uh, percentage of tonnes coming through us. post divestiture, we'll be back down to 30 sites. We talk about the power brands before, um, but there'll be about 20 main brands for us that we're still making. Uh, the team will be 850, 24 million cases, and 260,000 tonnes of capacity. Um, just a breakout of, it's a bit a little hard to see, but that's the world, and there's a breakout of California. <laughs> Green is what we've retained, red is what we've divested, and yellow is third party. So a global operations base, we still have presence across the world, starting to uh, really focus up in terms of the US. We will, uh, Canandaigua site over the East Coast goes, so really a uh, Californian-centric uh, um, business, a little bit up in Washington. And obviously from a spirits perspective, we've got Mexico still on, we're spread out through the US. Canada goes now for us, and Svetka is coming in from Sweden. So not only is the team dealing with the divestiture, you heard it from Robert before, but unless we're making what the consumer wants, we're not going to be successful. And the consumer and what they're looking for from us is changing all the time. 
and we as a business want to get after it. So taking what Robert was talking about in terms of the consumer trends, how does that look from an operations perspective and what are we doing about it? So from a premiumisation uh, example, taking Simi Chardonnay, uh, Simi is a brand that hasn't had a lot of love. Uh, the team, the exec team are really in, want to put a lot of focus on it. There's a lot of heart in that story. It's, it's one of the oldest brands in the US. It was set up by a, a, a female lady back, back in the day, went right through prohibition, uh, still made wine, stuck it down low in the ground where no one would find it and basically bootlegged their way through prohibition to, uh, to where it is today. And that story, we're about to make, take the dust off it and make it ring true again to the consumers. But what we're doing right now, given it's harvest, we've got to get some fruit in. So we're out there picking some fantastic Russian River uh, Chardonnay, some Son Sonoma Chardonnay, to put it into some tiering that you'll start to see come through in the next sort of nine, 15 months in the Simi and the new rejuvenated Simi, uh, Simi package. Organics, and we talked a little bit about sustainability and what that means and where we're going. Well, not only did we make an investment up in uh, Vianetto, Venice, for, uh, for our, uh, to be able to produce more and more Prosecco, it's where Pinot Gris is coming from for us. We're about to release an organic Pinot Gris coming from, uh, from, from Rufino. Um, we're also doing great things in New Zealand. We're part of New Zealand Sustainable Wine Growers uh, in terms of what we do with Kim Crawford and Nobolo and really pushing those, uh, those wines through. Um, and then from a, con a convenience and a way to consume, you heard about all the, uh, the new wines that are coming out in, in bourbon barrel and rum barrel and so forth. And Woodbridge is the next, tier, uh, the next brand to, uh, to, to, for us to release in, in that range. There's a lot of work going on there. Casanova High West are always expanding on their single barrel program where you as a customer can go in and select an individual barrel and then have that packed up by us and, and sent to your restaurant or to your store or whatever needs to be. We're in the process of justifying at the moment uh, can investment for us to be able to run cans at, uh, at Woodbridge. Prior to this, we've been using our beer assets, craft brewing assets uh, around the country. Um, but as we start to get scale, as we start to need flexibility, Kim Crawford's coming in cans, 250 ml, which we worked out last night, it's about eight and a half ounces, I think, Jim, and then 12 and a half ounces, I think, for the 375 ml. But we're, we're running different formats of cans. We need to run different clusters and pack types in terms of what we, we, we come off the line, whether we're running sleeves, whether we're running preprint. But this investment will allow us to be flexible, it'll allow us to be nimble, and it'll allow us to get after it in a big way. And Crafters Union is another great example of a brand that we brought out of another part of our business. It came out of the New Zealand business. It was a wrapped bottle, with, and, and, and the artwork came from, from students who got an award for if it was selected per varietal. So you were rewarding, uh, rewarding students down there to, to come up with the, uh, the great designs that are on there. Um, we uplifted that after they started cans. We brought it here to the US, and this is running... A, a, superbly well for us and gives us confidence that, as, as Robert said, bringing up this next brand, um, that we will have the same success and, and, and look at that. And we're also looking at Woodbridge and Tetra. Right, so we've been running Vendage. Vendage is going to Gallo. We've been uh, uh, Rex Goliath and things. But Tetra and the way that we look at that um, convenience package is something that we need to be after as well. So we as ops need to make sure that we've designed the network and we are ready to go at, 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 with whatever gets thrown at us in terms of um, capability, needs, uh, varietal needs, and uh, from a, f a making sure we start thinking about sustainability and what the, what the consumer's after in that space. So that's two of the big things that are on our plate at the moment. Taking our core base of where we are today, we talked about safety a little bit before, but making sure that we take care of our people day in, day out. We talked about how quality is absolutely front and centre for us at all times, and making sure our customers getting what they need in a timely fashion uh, is also extremely important. So taking those core strengths overarched with the great team of people, what does our future state need to be if we're going after a premium portfolio, 25% of our of our revenue coming from MPD and uh, innovation, and, and and at the same time a condensed, porf, a, a condensed network in which we do have some drags, 
And we're going to be challenged with some, some overheads in, in, in our packaging facilities. But the team have had some great ideas, and, and we'll talk about this in a minute, on, on how to overcome them so we don't miss a beat in our charge towards our 30% uh, operating profit. So our future state. We talked about it. Premium, more agile production. Ready to go when we need it. We want an on-time and to service level. I think we've been a little bit vanilla in the way we've been looking at things. We'll do anything for anyone. But some, at some points, we need to make sure that we've got our customers categorised in the right way, our brands are categorised in the right way. We've got to make sure that our service delivery methods are categorised in the right way, and, and, and the way that we take orders and fulfil orders is all sort of lined up, and, and Robert talked about that before. It's about process. We've been a little hand-to-mouth in Excel spreadsheets and, as opposed to database and real-time uh, metrics to help us run uh, operations, and we're investing in that. So we talked a little bit about highest and best use of capital before, but th uh, freeing up some capital allows us to put in a big data ring, uh, uh, a network into Woodbridge, and surprise, surprise, we went from basically having pigeons taking, taking temperatures of our tanks to being able to sit on a computer screen uh, at any one time and then being able to dial up and down the temperature of those tanks, which is extremely important during harvest to control the ferment. Inventory. It, uh, it's always something that uh, has been in the back of our minds is how much inventory sits between us in terms of, let's say, Woodbridge to where a customer is actually on shelf with Woodbridge. And we're getting after this in, in, in a fast way and in a, in a matter of fact way. But we think there's a lot of opportunity in our supply chain from end to end to really look at inventory and make sure we have the right amount of the right brands when it counts. We want to work back from the consumer, be collaborative on our way through and work more as a, as a leadership team rather than silos. So Jim and I are working closer, closer, closer together. Matt Deegan, who, who runs our, our sales business, we need to be holding hands and making sure that us, the consumer, understand then what the distributor needs and then what we need to do is from an operations perspective. And then lastly, it's just continuing to work the network and working our assets harder more as Constellation than, than, than Robert Mondavi or Simi or, um, or Charles Smith. It's working it all together as, 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 as one group of great brands, but we have a fantastic network behind that we push and pull the demands we need through our production facilities. And lastly, just talking through a little bit more on looking at the ways in which we look at individual brands and individual SKUs and making sure the bill of materials, all the cost inputs that are going in are very uh, aligned to what the consumer wants and where the consumer wants to pay it. So we, we said before, you know, COGS is made up of 50% great costs. We've got another conversion cost that's maybe 10, 10, 15. We've got some packaging costs. We've got some dry goods. Takes you up to about 93% by the time you're there. Transportation and logistics are small. Overheads are small. So if we want to make an influence in terms of the way that uh, we go about our business and margins, we really have to get after the way we can our conversion, which I talked to you about uh, a little bit before. We also need to get about making sure that the right fruit goes into the right bottle at the right cost. And Looking at it from a menu of options and dialing this up across the board is going to be incredibly important as we, as we move forward. So not to take you just from, and leaving you with just words, I wanted to give you some clear, concrete examples of where we're heading and, and reasons to believe. So margin expansion and agil agility. Designed based on value. And what we mean by value is what is the consumer going to pay for? By brand. We have to get after Woodbridge, we have to get after Svetka, and we have to get after RMPS if we're going to have any hope in, at all in, in, in getting to a 30% margin without the help of just pricing or and the help of, uh, of, of not spending enough on marketing where we need to. So I've given a rough percentage down the left-hand side of the different areas over the time frame that we're starting to look and go after a few key things, which I'll talk through in a minute. But the takeaway from this slide is from our total cost input that we have as a business, we're after a 10% saving off of that base. 0.6% short term is going to come from transportation and distribution. I mentioned before we do everything for everyone. We'll send a case over here, we'll send three cases over there. Is that the right customer to send a case to or three cases to? And I'm not talking about 
compromising on service level quality at all. It's just making sure that when we have a truck, we fill the truck up, or when we're going to a customer, that potentially that, that customer has a couple other orders that we can also um, um, put together rather than seeing a, a single line or, uh, order on a day and, and, and instead of matching it to a week. Can we send products straight out of Woodbridge straight to our customer where it makes sense? Can we work more with the beer team in terms of understanding what their, what their transportation network looks like and, their, and, and the way that they're getting after their, uh, taking their product through to the customer? We have 120 odd carriers that we use currently across the volume that you saw before. Beer has 24 carriers across the volume that, uh, that they have. So complexity we've probably introduced and we've never had a chance to sort of stand back and say, hey, can we do this a little bit better? We want a better mix of rail and, rail and, uh, and intermodal and, and, uh, and trucking. We, we need to look at our C-frame. Field to finish goods, 0.5% short term, and then we'll see a big chunk uh, in, in, in the F21 and on. This, this looks at not only the grapes that are going into the specific products as we, we run the diagnostics across it, but it also is looking at our dry goods, making sure that that's the, that, that's the right, right dry goods at the right time. We, when I look at harmonizing, having a small selection of what we can choose from, we have something like 150 different bottle types that we use in wine. Now, I could line up five or six of those and we couldn't tell the difference between those five or six. It just happens we've never had a chance to really sit back and go, hey, can we pick one? And maybe one will make it a little bit simpler for us in operations and nobody's going to see it in, on the shelf and no one's going to be sort of experienced that. So that's the kind of thinking and the kind of rationale we, we're going after. And please don't think for a second that we're sitting there as operations going, you can have one glass, you can have two uh, different types of label, you can have three different types of cartons. This is a collective decision that we get together as a team and look at the value, look at the whether or not it does make a difference. And then we also ask ourselves, if it does make a difference, does it make a meaningful difference in where we would see a slowdown to what the consumer's purchasing from us or shifting to another competitor? So we're looking at the competitor set on an ongoing basis. Label weight, carton weight, glass weight, glass color, and so forth. And I'll get to a couple of specific examples in a minute about Woodbridge. Four wall efficiency, that talks about all the great things that we're doing within our operations space. No, we've had $20 million of saving over the last three years. Colin's going after more, as is the spirits team and, and, and what they're doing. And we're looking at that all the time. That's activity-based costing. It's the right labour force for harvest based on the, the length of harvest and what's actually happening on a schedule basis. Rather than just going lump sum, we need three months worth of labour. It's going to come in on August 1 and it's going to finish up on October 30. Right, it actually looks at, well, we don't actually bring in too much fruit for the first three weeks of August, so maybe we only need 10% of that force. Then we're going to jump up to 30%, and then we're going to go at 100%, and then we're going to scale back down again. So it's, it's, it's really emulating and mirroring the intensity of the work that needs to be done, making sure they're quality at, at, at all times. It's also about reducing waste. Complexity of bottles, complexity of dry goods, complexity of wine blends, all these sort of things at the same time uh, will create a waste stream. And waste stream after waste stream after waste stream adds up. So we're going after even the smallest, minutest detail, but in a business of our size, if we don't do that, we're missing out on a lot of opportunity there that allows us to, to make the, our product a lot more efficiently, gives Jim a little bit more money to be able to make sure we're talking to the consumer in the right way. Moving to the big 3% bucket, this is really starting to look at how our vineyards are being planted. It took, I gave you the example of uh, Tokelon, this highest and best use philosophy. We just finished a vineyard planting in, in Lodi, so North Central Valley, uh, near Woodbridge, 550 acres. It's planted out to red blending varietals, right? These are varietals that we traditionally had to go and buy on the Central Coast or up, in, uh, up Napa, Sonoma Way, and these will go in to help with our prisoner brands, uh, brand family, we're going to help our RMPS family. It is unheard of for us as Constellation to consider Lodi as a source of fruit for, that, for, for those particular um, brands. But this vineyard's been planted in such a way with the right clones, with the right varieties, that the, the quality offer here will surpass those regions where it's not been a prime focus to grow those varieties. And so we're confident that we can substitute 550 acres of our own vineyard and our own fruit into blends that have been sourcing uh, fruit upwards of $2,000 a tonne. 
So that gives us great confidence then that you'll see those cogs and those margins over time when those wines are released, as I said before, coming through. And us as a business, we've got 65,000 acres of vineyard that we're taking this harvest off. We've got 77 varietals. So the complexity that sits there, if we go through line by line, as we said before, in terms of block allocation, but importantly where and what brand it's for, and is it the right fruit mix for that particular brand, again, without ever, ever compromising on quality or style, this is where we're going to see some great inroads. So tidying up here as our contracts start to come off, looking at what we could plant ourselves, and a lot of times we look at growers and partnerships to what they may need to plant to make sure that their vineyard is not going to come to an end in three years and they have business for the next 25 years. So we do a lot of partnerships around the world with our grower base with new plantings, new ideas and set them up um, in a sustainable way. Forecasting, planning and inventory, we talked a little bit about before, we're a bit hit and miss on where we are. We can get a lot more focused and a lot more narrow in terms of the decision making there and work as a team from our distributors, our sales teams, back through our customer service teams, looking at the inventory that we've got sitting truly as days on hand, safety stock, how much we've got sitting with our distributors, how much we've got sitting with Constellation, all those things we're looking at at the moment, and we're after 0.9% in that, in that cost category. And then lastly, as we've got some new, as we've got the, not new, but the, uh, the components of our network that we're left with, with Constellation go forward, how do we really make them work hard? How are we making them work together? And a, and a great example of that is we are now looking at the, Ra the old Ravenswood winery, which is over in Sonoma, is actually now going to be like our second, our second uh, prisoner winery in terms of the fruit that doesn't fit into our Napa facility because of permits and so forth. It is a fantastic facility for, now, uh, for us to now use as a prisoner, or well, for prisoner supply. And this hasn't been done before because Ravenswood would have done Raisinwood and Prisoner does Prisoner and Mondavi does Mondavi. But all that sort of thinking and going on, that's how we're, how we're getting about that. So finally, in wrapping up here, in terms of making sure we are focused first and foremost on Woodbridge, with a couple of things that we've gone after, making sure that bottle type and, and, and decisions around bottle use uh, are, are the right ones and taking some complexity out. We're about to do a repack, a refresh of the label and looking at some capabilities behind that. But that will also allow us to tidy up the number of uh, label types that we have, the number of carton types we have. We've got instances where we're putting things into printed cartons that get ripped apart in store because they're never going to be a point of sale material. They're going to be just put clusters on shelf, but yet we spend a whole lot of money making pretty cartons to go out that just get ripped up and put in the recycle. So these are the kind of things that we need to uh, look at really, really hard there. We've had skew proliferation that you couldn't believe. If I told you there was more than 100 different skew types of Woodbridge, I think you'd be surprised. And there is a huge amount of complexity in the skew. And, 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 and not only that, it's, it's like the last 25% of, uh, of that skew mix is, is making its negative margin. So it's dilutive to our overall ambition. So us analysing that and looking at that in the right way allows us then to make very clear in, uh, decisions around what, what the remainder of the base of Woodbridge needs to be and where we need to head with that. And coming through also, we've got these margin accretive MPD products like the, uh, like the, uh, the barrel aged uh, series that's coming through. We get cans right through the investment we're going to make. We have Tetra coming through and then suddenly Woodbridge doesn't look like a, a, um, a dilutive to our, to, our, to our ambition of 50 and 30. We start to prop that up. We start to get three, 400 points and then suddenly we start to get very, very close, if not better, than where we need to be heading, which gives us a great amount of confidence that as we tackle Speedca and RMPS, these opportunities are going to exist as well. And we just need to do it in a very sustainable way. And at the end of the day, making sure that quality is, is, and style is never compromised. So in summary, where we've been, we've got some, we've got some runs on the board. Now we've had some headwinds as wine and spirits. The top line perhaps hasn't performed as well as we have. Some of the brands haven't performed as well as we've, we've, we've needed. But the, but the operations team, the team that's come together as an A-class team and day in, day out, is, uh, comes to work looking for opportunity, looking, looking to make it better. Takeaway, we got the best team in the game. We never will compromise on quality. 
style. It's so important to us. I want everyone to know that Prisoner today tastes like it did when, when we purchased it. This, this is the same with Mayomi. The only reason we will change that is if the style of the, well, the consumer is asking us in the Mayomi set to change that style for us. And we can track that really well and, and have the confidence that we don't allow things to go to bottling. So Mark West, examples of the past are not going to happen into the future because that's what we come to work for. Transforming, transforming our network, you saw the complexity of it. We want to line it up. We want to make sure that it's right for the consumer, right for the MPD, but importantly, it's working really hard for us because if we can squeeze the best costs into the business in terms of how we make things, it sets us up to make it a great business base to hand over to Jim and to Matt and for Robert to run in terms of the right cogs, world-class cogs, the right quality, off to the consumer with brands that love and a team that's really passionate about going after, and that's how we're going to win. And that's, that's, that's the game that we're in, to win. So th with that, thank you very much. And we've got to have a break for 15 minutes, I think, Patty. Yep.
again, everybody. If everybody could please take their seats. We're going to get started. And I know you've all been asking. We are going to post the slides. So um, they'll be up shortly, OK? So uh, anyways, uh, without further delay, I'm going to bring up uh, Lisa Schnorr, who's CFO for our wine and spirits business. And then uh, Jim Sabia will wrap it up. And then we'll do Q&A, OK? Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Patty. Um, welcome to beautiful Napa. I just moved here in July, and I'm still amazed every day at how beautiful it is. From Rochester, New York, yes, of course, um, where I live most of my life, so, yes. Um, I think I'm going to use my cheaters, too, because it's not, there's not a lot of lighting up here. Um, so welcome back. Um, before the break, Robert took us through the Wine and Spirits vision and strategy and how we plan to transform the business. Then Sam talked about some of the great work we're doing, he and his team are doing on the supply chain to unlock significant value there. In a few minutes, you're going to hear from Jim Sabia, who's got some really great marketing uh, materials to show you, and he'll talk more about our investments in brand building and consumer demand building activities to accelerate our growth. I have the boring part today. I'm going to talk about the financials. So we'll keep it short and sweet. I'm going to spend the next few minutes outlining how our various transformation initiatives give us great confidence in our ability to outpace the high end, to outgrow the market, and to out-execute our competition, and deliver financial goals of mid-single-digit top-line growth and migrating towards operating margins of 30%. As Robert mentioned, our strategy is focused on high growth, high margin opportunities where consumer trends are favorable. These opportunities are concentrated in the high end, generally at $11 and up, where we see overall dollar growth in the high single digits, driven by growth in super premium, ultra premium, luxury, and super luxury price segments. After completing the Gallo and Black Velvet transactions, we'll have about 24 million cases globally of wine and spirits volume, and that's using fiscal 19 as a starting point and subtracting. <clears throat> With approximately one-third of that volume operating at $11 and up. The remaining two-thirds is made up of three large-scale brands, the first one being Woodbridge, which is about 9.5 million cases. And that plays in the popular price segment, which is declining in the mid-single digits. Svedka is about 4.5 million cases. And in, it plays in the vodka category, which is growing at about 2%. And RMPS, Robert Mondavi Private Selection, is about 2.4 million cases total. The majority of this volume is in the base tier of that brand, which plays in premium glass a segment that's declining low single digits. But a growing portion is in the barrel age tier, which represents about 30% today of the brand in total, and it comp competes in the super premium segment, which is growing mid to high single digits. These three brands, while competing largely below $11, gives us scale, both from an operational standpoint and importantly with our distributors and retailers. And collectively, our whole portfolio of outstanding products provides overall growth, volume, growth in volume and value greater than the industry. So how do you get from low single digit volume growth to mid single digit net sales growth? I'll talk about that. I'll go through the growth drivers, uh, just the highlights, and then I'll dig into some of them in, in greater detail. First, pricing and mix should add two to 300 basis points of growth, with about half coming from each. And then we expect to pick up another one to 200 basis points of growth through velocity acceleration and NPD and innovation. And that's net of product life, life cycle management or SKU rationalization. And so we add all that up and we see an opportunity to grow our top line in the four to 6% range over the next few years assuming stability in the marketplace. So digging into first mix, this is just simple math, really. 
when we look at our portfolio and where the growth is coming from with brands like Kim Crawford, Miomi, Rafino, The Prisoner, and High West growing faster than Woodbridge and RMPS, we see the mixed benefit. But that goes beyond brand mix and also uh, really gets into skew mix. So I talked about the RMPS barrel age tier versus the, the base tier. The barrel age tier is priced at about a 30% premium to the base tier, and it's growing at a 20% rate versus the base tier, which is essentially flat. Pricing is also going to be an important contributor of growth as we look ahead. Historically, we've been disproportionately focused on depletion volume, as, gro as Robert mentioned, and used price as a primary growth lever. Going forward, we'll shift our focus to value and profit growth by eliminating deep discounts, simplifying our pricing structures, and raising prices where appropriate. And through this process, we've been consulting with our distributor partners, and they're very supportive. In one instance, we were able to reduce the number of deals on one brand from over 100 down to seven. So it's a win-win for us and for our distributors. We need to do this throughout the portfolio. And we'll sustain it through automation of our price promotion management systems. And let's face it, we've got some great success here from our beer business. And we're taking the learnings from the beer business and translating them over to wine by investing incrementally in the consumer to drive demand for the brands, which gives us pricing power. Of course, in the short term, we might have a bit of a drag on volume, but we'll mitigate that through incremental consumer investments. Jim will talk a little bit more about drivers and drags in a few minutes. But you can see how it's important that revenue growth management and our marketing programs work hand in hand to get the value increase through price. As Jim likes to say, price up, spend back. In addition to pricing power, our marketing investments should allow us to accelerate our velocity and get a greater return on our distribution gains. We can see these benefits from some of our recent media investments on the heels of our outstanding new national advertising campaign. We've seen improvement in trends in Woodbridge during the second quarter, and even in the latest IRI period, we continue, that brand continues to outperform its price segment. By consistently focusing on the consumer and increasing awareness for our brands, we believe these trends are sustainable in wine and spirits. And finally, innovation will become an ever more important part of our growth strategy. As Robert mentioned, this will include new to world brands, leveraging our ventures investments, and importantly, will emphasize building on the successes of our large shoulder power brands. Some recent examples include last year's introduction of Svedka Rosé, which has experienced great success in the marketplace. Compi combined with the media campaign we started running last year, Svedka Rosé has helped accelerate the growth, growth of this large scale brand. Our upcoming introduction of Kim Crawford Cans is also a really exciting new product, new innovation. Uh, we're excited about the potential to bring, to expand consumer awareness and bring more consumers into this great brand. And I might be a little bit partial, but I think it's some of the best packaging I've seen in a long time. So kudos to our marketing team for that. An RMPS buttery Chardonnay, which is rolling out to retailers in time for the holiday season. So when you, when you add up all these building blocks, you can see why we're so confident in our ability to achieve sustainable mid-single-digit top-line growth. So I'd like to turn now to, uh, to margins. Our operating margins are currently in the low to mid-20s, have been impacted a bit this year by the disruption caused by the delay in timing of the transaction. But as we look ahead, we believe we have a glide path to the 30%. Pricing and mix will contribute 1 to 200 basis points of margin expansion. The supply chain initiatives that Sam talked about will add another 3 to 400 basis points of margin improvement. And then ultimately, to achieve our mar margin targets, we need marketing and SG&A combined to be in the range of 20 to 22 percent. So we'll need to capture another 3 to 400 basis points in margin expansion through cost savings there. 
This is going to come primarily through SG&A, as marketing is already running at its targeted uh, 10 to 11 percent of net sales. In terms of stranded costs, which is heavily weighted towards SG&A cost takeout, we, we do continue to, to believe we can capture the 130 million we've been talking about. We're expecting to capture 20 million this year, despite having to manage the full portfolio for an ongoing basis. We expect another 110 million or so in benefits from stranded costs in the next couple of years through a combination of SG&A and COGS. Much of the COGS has already been identified and is included in the 10% reduction of COGS that Sam talked about earlier. So we'll need to get the balance from SG&A. Some of this has already been identified and is ready to be actioned as soon as we close the divestiture. The remainder will require looking differently at how we prioritize our SG&A spend. And having landed our, uh, our vision and strategy just recently, we'll use that to inform the capabilities required to support our future state and then build towards that future state over time. We plan to kick off an org design work stream in the November-December timeframe once we complete the supply chain transformation work. It was really important we got behind the supply chain work first because, as Sam mentioned, there's a longer lead time. A dollar saved today in grape or wine blend won't translate to savings on the P&L for one to two years. But we're confident we can get there and that we'll be able to get to the 10 to 12 percent SG&A load. So I want to turn to cash flow. I don't want to spend a lot of time on inventory, but I want to hit on this just quickly. Um, we believe there's an opportunity to take out up to $50 million in inventory all in. That's dry goods, bulk line, and finished goods through some of the initiatives Sam already outlined. Now turning to CapEx. Over the past several years, we've invested an average of 125 to 130 million annually. Before that, we were running at about $100 million or less. And frankly, we were under investing in the business. So we've had to play some catch up. And Sam talked about some of these things we've done in the, in the past few years. Incremental investments in our vineyards in New Zealand, expansion in Italy, both to support our growing import business. And we've made large investments in US vineyards to reduce our overall grape costs. To support our go forward business, we'd be looking at a run rate less than the 125 to 130. And we'll provide more insight on that in future months. This CapEx will be focused in areas that support our growth strategy, with a particular emphasis on building capabilities to support key consumer trends. The big buckets are high growth categories, including convenience formats, as Sam, Sam alluded to. We need to bring in capabilities to do cans and Tetra and ready to drink in-house, as well as California sparkling. These investments will allow us to bring some of our NPD packaging in-house and save a pretty, pretty meaningful amount of COGS, and these projects will have relatively short payback periods. The second bucket is continued expansion to support growth in our core brands, including Rafino, Kim Crawford, and Svedka, and then expanding our barrel program to support growth in our whiskey business, high-end wines, and spirit barrel-aged wines. And finally, as Robert alluded to, and I think Jim will hit on in a few minutes, we will need to upgrade some of our facilities, including Simi and Robert Mondavi. Both the wineries and visitor, visitor centers will need to be upgraded to support the, the relaunch of these brands. We want to make sure the consumer is getting an outstanding experience when they visit our facilities, just like we've done with the Prisoner Wine Company, which you'll visit later today. Also, you might be aware that a Montage Hotel is being built in Healdsburg, just up the street from our Simi Winery. So this is definitely the right time to invest in a facility upgrade there. We want to make sure we're capturing the traffic of people driving from their hotel into downtown Healdsburg, and they stop by and have a great experience at our Simi facility. And then finally, about a quarter of our CapEx program will go to support maintenance and repairs, and health, safety, and environmental. So to sum it all up, we see a great opportunity here with an outstanding stable of brands. 
We have a winning portfolio and a winning strategy to outpace, outgrow, and out-execute. And we see a path to delivering mid-single-digit top-line growth and 30% operating margins. Now, the delay in the transaction might take us a little bit longer to get there, but we're confident that we've got the right focus on the consumer to deliver on our strategy. And that's all I have. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to Jim and give him a little extra time to take you through some of our really exciting new marketing. Lisa. Oh, okay. Hello, how are you all? It's good to see you. Um, so, as you know, I know a lot of you from working on beer for the last 10 years or so, I've had the opportunity over the last 18 months to work on wine and spirits. And, um, you know, from a marketing perspective, I'll get into some of our principles. They're very similar. As you think about beer, think about wine and spirits, there's CPG marketing principles that we're going to bring over to, we're starting to bring over to wine and spirits. But learning about the product, you know, you're listening to Sam. I just, as I listened to him, I was learning more. And we have such a great portfolio of brands, and Robert talked about the power of brands. I'm going to take you through some of the work that we've done to get us ready to really accelerate this growth. So for marketers, right, what do we do? What's our responsibility is we have to increase our consumer demand. Now, Robert talked about this category being a very push category. And quite frankly, I didn't realize how much of a push category it was until I got into it, right? Continue to push, push, push. And then you have these price promotions that you have to cycle, so you push more and more price promotions. You get into this circle of pushing, right? But where's the pull? Where's the consumer demand? So for us, our biggest responsibility as marketers working with our sales folks, as they push, as the distributors push, our responsibility is to pull. How do we get the product off the shelf, off the display? And I'll share with you how we're going to do that. We spent a lot of time on developing brand positionings, right? What a mean, and they have to be meaningful, they have to be ownable, they have to be relevant. And you think about wine, there's a lot of wine categories, there's thousands and thousands of wine. So how do we differentiate our brands from all the other competitors out there? So as a team, with the marketing team, we spend months at a time auditing our brand, looking at what's meaningful, what's ownable, and what does the consumer really care? And I'll talk you through on how we did that. One of the biggest you know, initiatives we've had over the last 18 months or so is using analytics. You know, on the beer side, we've used analytics for a number of years where every month we take an analogy called the drivers and drags, which is a regression model. And we're doing that now with wine and spirits. And it's really allowing us to understand what's driving our business on a monthly basis and what's dragging our business on a monthly basis. And I talked to a, a number of you yesterday about Woodbridge, and Robert talked about taking price. And yes, we are going to take price on Woodbridge, and that will be a drag. We understand that. In this category, it's elastic, and we believe it's on average, you know, between 1.5 to 2 percent elasticity, right? So we understand that when we do take price, we're going to lose some volume. However, our responsibility is what's going to drive the business. So you have your drag, then you have to offset that by drivers. And drivers, well, I'll talk a lot about it, is distribution and media and promotions and retail and activation. The other area that we're spending a lot of time and energy on working with our sales counterparts is shopper analytics. At lunch yesterday, I asked a question, what percentage of wine is sold off of display versus off the shelf? And everybody said 50 off the display, 55 off display. And I thought myself, it was about 50-50, 50, 50. 50 shelf, 50 display. And actually, 84% of wine is off the shelf. And only 11% of wine is purchased from a display. Now, there are some key weeks around Easter, Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, and O&D that are more critical than others. But on average, you know, people, consumers buy off the shelf. So we have to win on the shelf. So how do we do that? And I'll share with you some analytics. So we're working closely with our sales counterparts, our distributor counterparts, and saying, yes, we have to get displays. <clears throat> However, every day, let's go fight for more facings. In some of our brands, it's not even about simple distribution. 
You know, and I'll get into Kim, um, Kim Crawford about that particular insight in that we found there. And as Robin mentioned and, and Sam mentioned, insight-driven innovation. It's going to play a role about 25% of our you know, volume going forward. And we're going to get out in front of it. We're going to do smart things. We're going to be consumer-centric in everything we do when it comes to innovation. But we're going to play. I mean, this consumer is moving so fast when it comes to innovation. You know, I talked a lot of you about, you know, seltzers last night. I mean, it's happening quick. So we have to be ready in wine and spirits on what's happening with the consumer. So here is, um, and I, I had the team go back literally four or five times. I said, I don't believe it. <laughs> and, uh, I don't, you know, I, I shop differently. I mean, but I don't believe it. So they went back and they went back and said, Jim, this is what's happening, right? A wine purchased by location, right? So 84% of wine purchase comes off the shelf. Right? You look at the cooler displays and comparing that, I, yes, it is higher than beer and spirits, but it's still only 11%. So displays are important and we measure displays. We measure feature and displays, but we have to win on the shelf. We have to win. So this is an analysis the team did and it's showing if we went from one facing of Pinot Noir, right, Miami, to two facing, to three facings, look at the amount of growth we would get. And then Kim Crawford, right? Woodbridge, Rafino Prosecco. And then we even did California Grocery. Kim Crawford, 750, going from one facing to two facings, picks up 69% of volume because that's where the consumer is shopping. And then if you, you all know wine shelves, right? They're, they remind me a lot about craft beer shelves. They're, they're, they're crowded. They can't, they can't even navigate. I go in front of it, you can't even see. However, when you get a brand, that has three and four facings that have the blocking of that brand. It's very, very easy then to find it and to purchase it off that shelf. So this is all the work that we're working with our sales folks about, you know, how do we then, you know, drive more velocity? Because the sales individuals will tell you, look, Jim, I can get more shelf space if you get me more velocity, right? So what comes first though? So we're working really closely with them, working with other distributors, working with our national accounts, and trying to share with them, this is what we're doing for the wine category. And this is what our vision is. This is our strategy. We're going to take price. And that's good for you, Mr. Distributor and Mr. Retail. Right? We're going to take price. And we're going to spend back. So we're going to drive consumer demand. We're going to take advertising. We're going to start advertising wine right, on TV in good properties to drive this category to drive more, because then we can take some pricing power. So this is a really big initiative we have with our sales folks on driving incremental facings against our power brands on shelf. And then we did an analysis of you know, space at, to sales. So, so we look at our brands in terms of the velocity we have, and then we velocity per point of distribution, and then how much space we have. And this just gives us more confidence in all the work that we have, the potential of our portfolio compared to some of our major competitors up top and then to individual brands down below. I mean, look at Naomi. In terms of the velocity per point of distribution, you know, the highest in Kim Crawford and even Woodbridge and Rafino. So our brands have very good velocity per point. So now how do we get incremental facings and incremental space on the shelf? So as Robin mentioned, here are our power brands, 10 brands. And you know, I have a tendency to look at this photo a lot and say, OK, what are we going to do with this brand? What are we going to do with this brand? How much potential does this brand have? I don't know about you all that came to High West with us yesterday, but I was blown, blown away by that. Right? I was by Brendan and his team and <laughs> how good that product was in the, in the potential of High West. And everybody says, Jim, you're going to mess up High West because you're going to put too much, too much money against it. You're going to turn it into a mainstream brand. We can take these wonderful brands that sell 100,000 cases that have so much authenticity and backstory and grow them into 200, 300 in the right way. Will you see High West on Major League Baseball or the NBA? No, you probably won't. But you're going to see it organically grow in certain parts of the cities in, in major markets. Then you take a brand like Woodbridge. You know, I'm going to show you some of that work. Rafino, we're working on that. Sveka, and the rest of the portfolio. And wait till you see the, the new prisoner tasting room 
and I'll share with you some of the new offerings we have for that. So Woodbridge, right? So the objective of Woodbridge is talking to consumers on why did Robert Mondavi, right, who made Napa into a world-class area of wine, you know, recognized all over the world on making incredible wines that Sam talked about, Tokelon. We're gonna taste any Tokelon today, Sam? <laughs> right? Why did Robert Mondavi make Woodbridge, right, back in the 80s, early, late 70s? Because he wanted to put good wine on every American table. He wanted to increase the household penetration of wine. You know, for he's Italian and Italians drink wine when they're kids. And not, no, not my kids. <laughs> I mean, it's part of their culture. <laughs> wine is part of the culture, right? It's part of the culture of, of Italians. And he wanted to put wine on every American table. So this was his objective, right? Putting wine on every American table. So we needed to tell that story. We needed to tell the story about why he did it. So here's kind of our media plan we have in terms of a national cable, digital, social, NFL, right? Big, big, big media dollars against Woodbridge, right? So we started airing in June of 17th of 2019, set a lot of networks and a lot of different social and digital. Also, we looked at Woodbridge in terms of Tetra. Sam talking about this, Tetra. We're gonna introduce Tetra and the GP on Tetra leases about almost 50 GP you know, on this SKU. Right, so we're gonna introduce this. Robert talked about you know, ready to drink, convenience. So this is going to be a skew that we're gonna introduce you know, with Woodbridge. And then we looked at here, okay, new segments to grow penetration. And this is the spirits barrel age that we just talked about and the price point of $7.99 versus the more traditional $5.99 or $6.99. So this is the spirit barrel age, the first in the popular brand segment. You know, and we're, we're gonna continue to push this in three varietals, you know, and shipping in January. So we talked about the drag, right, of pricing. These are some of the drivers to offset the drags, advertising, innovation. And this is hot off the press, still working out all the final details, but Woodbridge will be the official wine of Major League Baseball, right? So taking a big brand, taking a brand that has high household penetration, and Robert talked about a lot of households buy wine in America that's less than $10, $11. So we're gonna use all the assets that baseball can bring us. We get to use all 30 teams collectively in advertising and marks. We get to make all the POS, right? We wanna get on the floor. Displays are still very important to remind consumers about your brands, but also during the key holidays. We're gonna have TV and social. We're gonna have a chance to have consumers go to the All-Star game, go to World Series games, and that allows our sales folks, right, to be able to then go to a retailer and say, hey, put, why don't you put Woodbridge on the floor for July 4th because we're gonna send consumers to the World Series. So bringing in, the, so this is the brand where we're taking, you know, more of a bigger CPG approach. A lot above the line, a lot of below the line, a lot of advertising pushing this brand and then developing the pull for consumers. So we, we, we produced an ad. I'm gonna show you the ad. This is a 60 second spot. We're running it as we speak. And we're real proud of it. The, the consumer takeaway is very strong. So I'm gonna play it for you. At an age when most people are focused on retiring, Robert Mondavi was focused on putting good wine on every American table. That spirit that lives on in every bottle of Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi. So that's the spot we're airing um, from one to all, communicating why did Robert Mondavi to develop Woodbridge. So Woodbridge, now we go to Naomi. 
So what we do is we develop what we call a focus of sale. What is the focus of your selling communication? And for Miami, it's really about the unrivaled taste of this brand. You know, it really is a flavor forward, you know, isn't just a tagline. It's the way this brand tastes. You know, from Sonoma to Monterey to Santa Barbara is triapolated. You know, and it's made like no other for a taste like no other. This is a, such a unique brand that we're gonna continue to push. And we have a very high GP, and we think there's so much opportunity for this brand going forward. So for this brand, beginning in November, beginning September, I'm gonna show you an ad that we're gonna run on digital, run on social, and then we're gonna run during the November to December time period to put onto TV. Right, it's gonna launch in TV on November 4th during the biggest wine selling season, delivering over 400 million impressions. We have a 360 program in Miami, you know, a little bit different than Woodbridge, but very similar. So we thought about Miami, we thought about that consumer, we thought about, okay, what are the passion points around that consumer? And as we talk to consumers and we realize who we're gonna target, they told us they love to play golf. I like, I like watching golf, I like to play golf. So Miami is the official wine of the PGA Tour. And we activate about f five or six events during the course of the year. We have in-store merchandising, on-premise, public relations, the spot I'm gonna show you, and then the digital social. So here is a power brand. So power brands, the seven power brands, and then the three true estate power brands, you know, this is seven, they get a lot of 360, a lot of money spent against it, doing it in a way that's ownable to them, right? Ownable and emotional to consumers. So this is a spot that is on social digital right now that'll be airing uh, in TV in November. How do you make a Pinot Noir that tastes like no other? Start with tradition, then do your own thing. Use the most demanding grape you can find, then grow it in three different California regions. Pull out the best of each place. Push flavor in new directions. And put a bear on the label. Mayomi is a Pinot Noir crafted like no other for a taste like no other. Mayomi, flavor forward. So Woodbridge was talking about Robert Madavi as the winemaker and why he did his objective. This is a little more rational and functional based on what does this brand consist of and why does it taste the way it tastes and what we mean by it. So a little more rational, a little more functional, but we believe done in an emotional way that is engaging to consumers as they watch the film. So Kim Crawford, you know, this is an amazing brand that continues to grow with so much potential. It's the number one in dollar velocity in a super premium. It's growing 13% in its velocity. You know, number two in retail sales gains. We really truly believe this brand has so much upside. And we're targeting a different consumer against Kim Crawford. We're targeting you know, more female, more about this brand. We hear a lot from female consumers that Kim's a friend. You know, Kim gives me social confidence. I get with my girlfriends and we drink Kim Crawford together. So we're really targeting the female consumer when we talk about Kim Crawford. So this is some of the analysis that Robert was talking about in terms of just the awareness. So this is aided awareness of Kim Crawford on you know, on the left-hand side here, and this is 2016, this is aided. So this is a list of wine brands. And we say to consumers, have you ever heard of these brands? In 2016, it was 13. 2017, we got up to 17. And then 2018, up to 27. But look at the gap. So there's so much non-awareness of the brand called Kim Crawford. And then the thing about Kim Crawford is, once we do get consumers into the franchise, on the right-hand side is their buy rates and how much money they spend per brand. So as we increase our aware, aided awareness, as we increase our household penetration, and we get consumers into this franchise, they are very, very loyal to Kim Crawford. So when they buy it, they buy more of it. So we just have to continue to have consumers be aware of the brand, trial the brand, and then they will buy more of the brand. Our advertising, you know, this is our highest advertised brand we have in our portfolio. As you can see, TV, digital, social, and during some key sales periods across different networks that targeted more to a female consumer. As it's, uh, Lisa and Sam mentioned cans, this is the new Kim Crawford cans that we're going to introduce. They're two packs because they're 250 mLs. You have to have a 500 ml or a 375, so we have two packs here. 
great looking package. You know, we're really excited about the convenience aspect of this with consumers. So here's the new spot of uh, Kim Crawford. So very different than Woodbridge, very different than Miami, right? So this is where the ownable relevant positionings are critically important because as we did all this research on the wine category, they all look the same. You know, some food, some friends, swirling of the glass. We need it to be a little different. And it's not, it's not a criticism, it's just, it's redundant. You know, how do these brands break through, right? How do you break through, right? So this is uh, the advertising for Kim Crawford. I just want to make them for the record, when I said Woodbridge kids, I meant Italian kids 21 years old. <laughs> I mean, now I talk about 21 year olds as kids, so I, I apologize, I'm getting old. <laughs> so see me, um, you know, Robert and Sam talked about it, Lisa talked about it. Um, we had a lot of discussion around see me. And what are we going to do with Simi? It is a drag right now. It's not performing as well as our other power brands. But the more we talked about it, the more we understand, understood that the history of this brand, I think it's 1876, what they did during Prohibition, how they did it, we really truly believe that there's an important role that this brand is going to play in our portfolio going forward. Right? So what we're doing is we're truly getting underneath the brand, doing the audit, how are we going to position it, what's the focus of sale, Yes, it's been around for 135 years, but do they care? Do consumers care about that? Or do they want to know something else about the brand that's meaningful that makes them pick it up? We're doing a package redesign. We're going to we hire a new agency. And as Sam mentioned, we're going to do a reserve. Could you call back one, Adam, please? We're going to do, so we have Chardonnay. As Robert talked about the growth of Chardonnay, right? Chardonnays are coming back strong. So we have a super premium Chardonnay, ultra premium at $14.99, $15.99. But then we're going to have some Russian River Chardonnay, uh, other parts of Sonoma. We're going to have so different tiers of Chardonnay, right? Because Sonoma, I'm learning more and more. I'm learning from Sam and Chris Millard and the whole group. Sonoma is really synonymous with great, you know, Chardonnays. So we have a brand called Simi that makes a wonderful Chardonnay. How do we make three and four and five all the way up the ladder, up to $45 potentially? you know, of Chardonnay's from Simi. So, um, so we also have Cabernet Sauvignon now in the Valley and then Landslide, so there's more opportunity with this brand and then some work to be done on the tasting room. This will eventually, right, have 360, it's a power brand, it's gonna have new packaging, the retail up, in the, up at the winery, public relations, innovation, I'll share with you, trade and then digital and social. And then this is a, uh, a new SKU that we just introduced. So this is Simi, you know, Rebel Cast. We age this in rye barrels, so it gives it a little bit different. I, as Brendan talked to us yesterday about rye and how we get rye and how, we, how rye is a different taste of rye and all the different uh, aspects you get from rye. So we aged, you know, this Simi into rye barrels. They're now available. And we priced it a little bit higher. The pricing point is about $21, $22. So we're excited about this, it's just going in market, but the Rebel cast, it goes back to the history and the attitude of this winery, you know, back in, during Prohibition where I think they, Sam, I think they put a half a million cases of wine in the basement. Didn't tell anybody, put it in a, half a million cases in a basement. It's a lot of, that's a lot of wine in the basement. And then when Prohibition broke, they sold a lot of wine and that just carried them through the years they had a shutdown. All right, so there's more film. We're going to have film on uh, working on Simi, but now Rafino. So, you know, Robert and I are going to go in a couple of weeks to go visit the team out there to really get under, underneath this brand to understand what's working, how can we do more. Just give you a little, you know, in terms of a fact, Rafino Prosecco, we sell about a half million cases or so. La Marca is 1.5 million cases. 
right? So we really truly believe that there's so much upside for Rafino Prosecco, right? To go and, and, and get up to 1.5 against a competitor. We look at, you know, in terms of, you know, Rafino Lumina and these brands, the Rafino Reserva de Cale, Modis. So looking at this whole portfolio and saying, okay, what do we do with this portfolio? Where do we put more money against it? The Pinot Grigios, the Chianti Casicos, the, some of this other brands here. And then what's the strategy going forward? So we, we hire an agency. We're getting underneath the focus of sale. And what we're really talking about is, you know, if you if ever spent any time in Italy or you've been to Italy, the one thing Italians do very, very well is they enjoy life, right? They truly enjoy life, whether it's, you know, the wine they drink, the clothes they wear, the cars they drive, the coffee they sip, right? Go to, go to the bank, it's a different story. You know, you wait online for a long, long time. It's very disorganized, right? There's a line, everybody just rushes, right? So the Italian way of living is such an incredible, you know, way to live. It's the art of living. So we're going to bring this to life through Rafino. You know, Rafino, we believe, in America, is the number one Italian brand. So what can we do with this, right? We have Prosecco, we have white wine, we have red wine. Can we introduce it into maybe some uh, ready-to-drink? Can we do maybe, uh, um, you know, liqueur, uh, limoncello, or amaro, amaro, or there's so much opportunity with this brand as an Italian brand in America. So we're going to do a, a lot of work on this, working with the innovation team, working with the brand team, you know, to get underneath this and really go after this brand. And here's just some of the examples, right, in terms of the key holidays. One of the things we're really working closely with our sales division is that we're outlining the calendar, right? So there's Easter, Memorial Day, July 4th, and then November, December. In the wine category, you do get a nice little spike in Easter, and then it's kind of, kind of flat. It's interesting. It's kind of flat through Memorial Day, July 4th, Labor Day, and then November, December, you get your huge spikes. Well, we're saying, well, wait a minute. You know, we're going to participate. I mean, a lot of people drink wine and spirits during Memorial Day and, and July 4th and September, right? So what do we do? Let's line up the calendar. Let's line up the major holidays. Let's line up our retail priorities with sales and marketing working together. So the retail sales team working with the brand teams develop these kind of displays. And so and then our sales folks work with their distributors and say, OK, Memorial Day, we want to be on the floor with you know, Rafino sparkling on this time period. right? And then we're going to go and execute against this. And then we'll give above the line advertising. So we have the below the line support and then the above the line support to really drive this business. But it's a great looking brand. And it's got the, the color of Rafino Prosecco. It's an equity that we're going to continue to build on you know, moving forward. And uh, we're going to introduce, I think Sam showed this, organic grapes, Rafino Prosecco Organic, two, priced at $2 above our current Prosecco. But really have a, have a channel strategy. Don't put it everywhere. Go into the Whole Foods of the world. Go into some of those retailers that really care and those consumers care about organic. You know, target some liquor stores, target some on-premise accounts. All right, then transitioning to the prisoner. So those are, and I'm going to have Specker at the end, but those are the six wine brands that are part of the power brands, but the prisoner. Right? Our objective is to be the number one luxury plus wine brand. And how are we going to do that? We have to increase our household penetration. We have to increase our awareness. You know, Robert mentioned this is a 200-case brand, the prisoner, at $45. You know, five, six, seven years ago, I don't think anybody in this room would have said that you can sell 200,000 cases of a wine brand for $45. But this is where the consumer is going. They're, they're trading up. They're saying, you know what, $45 for a bottle of wine, it's, not a, it's a really good value, especially a value of a brand like this. So it, it is, it's got, you know, we're going to enhance the awareness of some of our secondary SKUs. But we have some work to do, right? We have some work to do on positioning this brand. You know, we really think about, okay, what does this brand stand for? And if you've never been there, we're going to see today, as you walk into the tasting room, it does a great job of, it, of kind of sharing, like, what does this brand mean? What's, what's the connection with the consumer? What's the attitude? What's the DNA of the prisoner? So it's the prisoner wine company, so everything we do. So here are some existing brands that we have underneath the umbrella of the prisoner wine company. Right, so there's a Saldo, which is a Zinfandel. There's Cuttings, which is a Cab, and we're going to taste some of those, you know, later today. 
But then as we think about it, how do we, if we're going to line extend and we're going to do innovation around the prisoner wine company, how do we do it? Because we have to stay true to the DNA of the prisoner wine. The prisoner brand is our master brand, right? That's our master brand. So if we line extend it, how are we going to do it? So this is, um, this is new to the world. We haven't really communicated too much about this yet, but um, we're going to launch this in January. It's called Unshackled, right? It's a red blend cab and rosé. As you can see, the targeted price. So the, the strategy is to develop the innovation strategy of fuel growth, attracting new consumers. So one of the things I've learned about in wine is that your price points will, will tell you the household penetration. So if you start at $10, there's a certain amount of household penetration. You go up to $15, you go to $25, you go to $35, you go to $45, and the household penetration of consumers buying these wines gets less and less and less the higher you go, right? It makes sense. You're spending $45 on wine, there's not that many people that can do that. But, but as you come down the ladder here, as you come down the pyramid, we're realizing that there is a lot, there's a lot more potential of volume in the $25, $24 range. So we want to capture that. We want to capture the trade, you know, that part of the category that we currently are not playing with it with a brand from the prisoner. And we love the name, you know, Unshackled. It talks about the DNA of the prisoner wine couple. We think the, uh, the label is very creative. As you can see, it's, it's, it's a lock, right? You have to figure out how to open it up. You know, we talk about the prison, TPWC, right? Unshackled, red blend. So I, I don't know if we're going to taste any of these. Sam, Sam I'll get us some in the back, right? Chris, <laughs> we'll, we'll get some. We'll taste some. Chris, we have any unshackled? Yeah, we'll figure that out. <laughs> we'll just pour in a glass and tell you it's unshackled. And you, know, you won't even know. And we're going to have a red blend. And I, I tasted it uh, last week. Uh, it is very, very good. I mean, for $24, $25, we're so excited about it. And here's another one. So this is Eternally Silenced. Again, look at the label. You're going to see this today. This is wax. This is a Pinot. And this is a little bit higher price. So this is more like the prisoner. This is a little bit higher price. So this is another opportunity we have. We just had a kickoff PR in New York City a couple weeks ago, doing some work on digital and social. Really think that, I mean, just the look and feel. So Unshackled and now Eternally Sound, it just feels like a, a family of brands that we're putting together for the Prison of Wine Company. So we're really excited about, you know, this brand and the potential of this brand. You know, it's a little different go-to-market, though. It's a little different marketing mix, right? It's not going to be like Woodbridge. It's not going to be like Naomi at Kim Crawford. You know, the tasting lounge, as you'll see, is a big part of that. But Robert talked about D to C. How do we do more D to C? You know, with this particular brand. And you're gonna see some brands today that we don't have, we don't haven't commercialized it. They're just in the, the tasting room. And do some PR and all this. So I'm um, really excited about this. As we said, we wanna be luxury plus category. We really think the Prisoner Wine Company has so much opportunity. So then we go to Robert Madavi, which is a magical place if you've never been there, and then Tokalon to see you know, and taste uh, some of the products that come off of that, off those lots. It's absolutely an amazing place. It's, it's spiritual. You go up to, we're going to go up to today for dinner, Patty. Are we having dinner? Oh, we're having a lunch at Robert and Dobby, then we're going. <laughs> so what we're going to do is eat and drink. <laughs> 12 o'clock on, just like yesterday. So <laughs> this is a magical place. Robert talked about renovation. You know, one of the first meetings that Robin and I had, we met uh, at a meeting, went to a bar in San Francisco, and we, he, he said, well, what do you think about Robin and Dobby? Should we renovate it, or should we just let it go? And I'm like, no, Robin, we have to renovate it. Absolutely. This is our job. This is, you know, I didn't say this is our legacy, but, you know, this is what we need to do. So we have the president and myself and the team. We're really excited about what we're going to do eventually with the Robert Mondavi winery and tasting room. Incredible brands, you know, incredible wines. And it's such a, you know, it's such a, a, a back story that we're going to tell. We told the Woodbridge story. We're going to tell the Robert Mondavi private selection story. But we're really going to one day tell the story of Robert Mondavi and what he did for the wine industry and what he did for Napa Valley you know, in, in this country. And that's a story that needs to be told. And we're going to tell that story. So a lot of work's going on. We're looking at you know, doing an audit. We're doing a lot of research going on. Brand renovation, facility improvements, we, we have to get this right because this is so critical, the Robert Mondavi brand, right? It's the master brand of Robert Mondavi. You got Woodbridge, Robert Mondavi Private Selection, and you have Robert Pauline Napa. 
and Napa goes from about $35 for the Napa Valley cab. Then you go to Oakville, which is about $45, $50, and then you go all the way up to the reserve. And then we have some special products in the middle of that. But a magical place, magical wines that we're, we're excited about the potential of it all. And here's how we're going to do more of it. You know, different approach. This is more like, you know, the prisoner, right? More, you know, different types of activities, different types of marketing, different types of go-to-market strategy. And then High West, you know, we talked yesterday, the core four really focused on two, you know, American bourbon, double rye. How do we get that in all the right locations, on and off premise? How do we merchandise it? How do we tell the story? You know, listening to Brendan yesterday, we were, you know, as I was listening to him, I'm like, wow, we can write a, we can write a print ad of that one. Oh, wow, we can do social media on that. Just listening to him speak and listening to the passion he has and how great they make this product. There is such an, a wonderful story that we have to tell for this brand. And then we will do that going forward. As we talked about yesterday, here are some of the releases we have, the special products. But we have to do a better job on the core two first, right? Get to core two get the core four, and then use these as, you know, in and out specialty. You know, special products, in and out, we make it, we sell it. But how do we go from 100, 120 to 250 to 300,000 for this particular brand? And this brand, as we go to market, it's a little different again, right? This one is a little more in terms of experiences, right? We have the experiences that we didn't go down to Park City. Maybe in a couple of years we do this again. We go, had to go to the Park City. It's an unbelievable restaurant if you haven't been there. How do consumers go there? They go to the distillery. You know, we have a lot of social and digital. We have advertising and a little bit of print. And we have events. So we're the official American whiskey of the U.S. Open uh, snowboarding. So we get actively involved with that. So really, Sundance. So a little more grassroots, a little more from above, below the line, up above the line. All right, so those are the nine power brands. And the last power brand I want to share is, is Speca. And, you know, as Robert talked about earlier, we, we positioned this brand. We went back and said, okay, what does this brand stand for? And if you're from New York, like a lot of you all are from New York, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Sveka in New York was a really big brand. And it had an attitude. It had a very unique attitude. And it broke through. It was pretty provocative, right? But then you, you, change, um, you, you change marketing leads, and they change it. <laughs> That's what marketers do. They come in and they change everything, right? So you had a new brand manager come in and change, a new brand manager come in and change. For, for, for the last five years, we'd never advertised it. They didn't really have a positioning, right? What was it? What does it stand for? So we went back, you know, we went back and looked at, you know, the brand. We, we talked to a lot of consumers. And we think about Specker, what is it? What does it mean to you? And they talk, and these consumers were their own individuals. They said, well, I don't care what people think of me. I'm gonna, I am who I am. I, I want to just celebrate my diversity and my inclusion. I want to be who I am. So we started thinking about Specker and how does Specker bring that to life? And we developed this campaign that we call Bring Your Own Spirit. And it really, you know, dramatizes our consumer and what we mean by bringing your own spirit. Be an individual. Stand up for yourself and be proud. So I'm going to show you the spot, but this is new news. You guys are getting a lot of new news today. This is all confidential, right? <laughs> this is, um, we're excited about this, right? This is the better, talk about betterment space, right? This is zero sugar. So this is a, a vodka pure infused with some flavors, but zero sugar. So we're going to ship this. The team did an amazing job. Robert, about six months ago, challenged us to say, look, you know, I'm, I'm watching this. I'm going to bars. I'm seeing botanicals. I'm seeing this betterment in vodka. What are we going to do? And the team worked really closely with Sam and his team. And we're able to really do, a, I, I believe, a really great job. The, the product is wonderful. And that's going to be introduced you know, in February. Um, in March national ship. So now I'm just going to show you the spot. We ran this spot um, last November, December, and it's, it's, it's just this when we saw a lift. We saw a pretty good lift. We we're like, wow, we ran this for six weeks at like 75, 100 TRPs, and we saw a lift, right? So now we say we, have, we think we have something here. So going forward in fiscal 20, we're putting more money against it. Fiscal 21, we're going to put more money against it. And the thing that's really going to work for us is now this is, Woodbridge is our big wine brand. This is our big spirit brand. So these are our two big brands that we have to get on the floor, 
during the key holidays. So we have to have below the line, we have to have above the line, we have to have sponsorships, we have to do it all. These are the two big brands, Woodbridge and Speca, that need a lot of resources and 360 marketing mix against it. And this is an ad we ran, we're in, a, in the process of developing a new ad, same campaign, but a different execution for next year. So here's um, you know, Bring Your Own Spirit. You are a rainbow in a sky full of gray, a heavy pour in a watered down world. When the room drinks you in, can you feel it? Never showing off. You steal the show just by showing up. This is your empty floor. Take it. Your canvas, fill it. Taste that can't be replicated. Flavor that can't be replaced. Darling, you are a limited edition. So, as you can see, um, 10 power brands, seven of them, really kind of 360, big marketing, above the line, below the line, three brands, you know, we're gonna take a different approach to. But these 10 brands, and Robert talked about focus, right? We used to have 70, 80 brands. We used to have marketing budgets that spread out all over the place. Now we have 10 power brands that we're gonna put all our resources against. We're gonna line extend, right? We're gonna do innovation against these brands. If you look at all the advertising, right, it talked about ownable, meaningful, and relevant positioning, all very different, right? It doesn't feel like just another wine ad. It doesn't feel like just another vodka ad, spirit ad. So this is where, you know, working with sales, working with operations, working with the teams, that we just feel really excited about the potential of this portfolio and this division going forward. So with that, I think it's Q&A. Yes.